Manuel Baltar. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Simone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear representatives, uh, politicians and technicians of the public entities that make up the European Historic Thermal Towns Association. A special salute to the Lord Major of Baden-Baden, Margaret Merham, and uh, to the head of the State Office for Cultural Heritage of Baden-Württemberg, because it's a pity for all of us not to be today physically in Baden-Baden with the autumn colors and magnificent thermal architecture. And it's an honor always to address all of you in my capacity as president of this organization. I want my first words to be to send to all the attendants and to all your families all my best wishes of good health in these difficult times. The association celebrates one more year the Thermal Heritage Day and talking about thermal architecture. And we do it because the European Historic Thermal Towns Association has proven to be an essential vehicle for transmitting the importance of thermalism and historical heritage for the cities and territories we represent. In its 11 years of existence, we have shown a shared vision and the benefits of networking overcoming international borders. Today and forever, we can say that thermalism is health, thermalism is life, and the thermalism is future. I highlight again the thermalism culture painting as the historical link that unites towns of Europe having thermal water as the basis of health, coexistence, and promotion of cultural heritage. The Thermal Heritage Day initiative will continue to defend more strongly the thermal wealth of the cities and regions of Europe giving greater international visibility to one of the most important natural resources available to the European Union. We aim to develop actions related to the development of a new sustainable model of European tourism linked to nature, natural remedies, wellness, and cultural activities. This organization has always been guided by the healthy, inspiring principles of Europeanism, by harmony and dialogue by respect and ambition, and it has been key to share management experiences in our public administrations, share problems and challenges. We all agree about the importance of thermalism as a strategic development, placing it as a priority commitment in our government's actions. And all this means that we are called to strengthen the bonds of public-private cooperation, a reality that can also characterize the structure and operation of ECTA itself. Organizing this event, the Thermal Heritage Day, we continue carrying the voice of thermalism, the voice of tradition and well-being, a thermalism that is a true value. Thanks to our incredible cultural heritage, incredible thermal architecture, and knowing that together we are incredibly strong. The European Historic Thermal Towns Association continues being an example of coexistence, an organization capable of setting new goals where the defense of thermalism and heritage, our historical legacy, is our reason for being. We must increase cooperation, building alliances with other organizations, generating projects that benefit the collective and increasing horizons to enhance the noble task of taking pride in our past and our thermal history. We want to be an active element when it comes to addressing new and necessary environmental health and culture policies, taking as reference the strength of our experience and trajectory with our nations. We are today actually celebrating the 18th European Week of Regions and Cities. The European Cities of Thermal Baths and Heritage raise our voices to claim our importance also in the process of European construction and our irrevocable decision to be part of the solution of the many crossroads we have to face today. Possibly the answer is in the third one. Thank you very much indeed and greetings from Orense, Spain. Good morning. Thank you very much, Manuel. Um, appreciating this start of our um, conference today and um, I would now like um, to continue
speaker. I am very happy to welcome Mr. Professor Dr. Klaus Wolf, the Head of State Office for Cultural Heritage in Baden-Württemberg. Good morning, Professor Wolf. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm too very pleased to welcome you to this conference. There are almost 1,000 listed architectural and garden monuments in the city center of Baden-Baden. In addition, the historic city center is a listed ensemble of 134 hectares. With this architectural, horticultural and urban development heritage, Baden-Baden has always been a focal point in the work of the State Office for Preservation of Monuments. Since 2009, we have also supported and accompanied the nomination of Baden-Baden as part of the Great Spas of Europe for the UNESCO World Heritage List. We are happy to do this because the impetus for this application came from the local citizens. So it is a bottom-up process in Baden-Baden as is generally desired for World Heritage applications. The decisive factor for the State Office for Monument Preservation was also that Baden-Baden has opted for the path of a serial and transnational nomination. Only in this way can the historical geographical magnitude and spread of the European bathing tradition and the diversity of its material culture and historical heritage be reflected on the World Heritage List. This total stock of European thermal architecture and spa towns must not be pushed into the background by the World Heritage nominations of the great spas of Europe. Even Baden-Württemberg alone is a veritable spa state with a high density of the most diverse spas and health resource besides Baden-Baden. Correspondingly, large is the number and range of historical spa and health resource architecture in the state. This range from the Roman bath ruins here in Baden-Baden, but also in Baden-Weiler, to many late medieval and early modern bath buildings and the typical spa architecture of the 19th century. As can also be found in neighboring Bad Wildbad to the large drink and Wandelhalle in the new building style from the 1930s in Bad Mervenheim. Ideally, an application procedure for UNESCO should always benefit the entire stock of monuments and the way in which they are treated in terms of monument conservation. This also applies to the Great Spas of Europe project. The program of the third European Thermal Heritage Day, organized by EHTTA, certainly does this. In this sense, I wish the conference a successful outcome today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. So you've seen this was recorded, at least we tried to make it um, wrapped up. Um, I am now really happy to um, welcome Mrs. Dr. Brigitta Ringbeck among us. Um, I don't see you yet, but I hope I have you. Okay. This is you have to unmute yourself, please. Um, Mrs. Ringbeck, uh, on one hand, is the chair of the governing board of the Enlarged Partial Agreement on Cultural Roots um, of the Council of Europe. And on the other hand, and, and this is why, why we are really happy to have you among us, um, as she is the coordinator of World Heritage um, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Germany. Good morning, Mrs. Ringbeck. Nice to have you with us. Good morning. So it is So good morning. Now, yeah. Yeah, okay. Wonderful. Uh, dear Lord Mayor Merkel, dear Mr. President, dear Mr. Wolf, Professor Wolf, dear Ambassador Weaver, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the invitation today. So as chair of the governing board of the enlarged partial agreement on cultural roots of the Council, Council of Europe, I should like to thank you for organizing and uh, attending uh, this meeting. This, this Digital European Term, Thermal Heritage Day. Thank you very much again. So culture is a cement that binds society together and makes the charm of the U European cultural diversity. Moreover, culture is a decisive factor for the competitiveness of a region. It is exactly this 
what adds to the cultural roots of the Council of Europe program. The program continues to develop and attract growing attention from both international institutions, national and local authorities, and the cultural tourism industry. Thanks to the support of our member states and the outstanding work of the now 40 cultural roots of the Council of Europe, I'm, I'm very proud to announce the first time 40 uh, cultural roots because it was exactly one week ago that we added two new roots to the list. The Council of Europe's Cultural Roots Program is especially characterized by a high level of civil society commitment and the voluntary work of clubs, associations and initiatives. It is a button-up movement that makes the cultural richness of Europe visible. Cultural Roots enable to travel and to discover new places away from classical travel routes. But European cultural routes also connect natural and uh, cultural world heritage icons. The European route of historic thermal towns is a shining example of this. That's why I'm uh, in my, my capacity as chair of the governing board as well as a focal point Germany for World Heritage. So that's why I am particularly pleased that the European Thermal Heritage Day takes place in Baden-Baden this year. Baden-Baden belongs, and a lot may Mergen uh, underlined it, few, it a few minutes ago, to the group of 11 past towns that has been nominated to UNESCO for inscription on the World Heritage List as a transnational serial uh, property. The series provides exceptional testimony to the spa tradition within the 19th century in Europe. However, the picture of this European phenomenon would not be complete without the numerous smaller spas all over Europe. The European route of historic thermal towns brings all aspects together and connects the, the sometimes hidden, but for the European region as important spas with those of outstanding universal value. There are exciting paths ahead of us. I'm sure that the European Root of historic thermal towns continue to expand and welcome new members, partnerships, and organization, organizations, all pursuing the same goal to preserve and convey Europeans' common cultural heritage and as a precious good which we have as a precious good which we have to preserve for future generations. So I'm very sorry that I am not able to attend uh, the entire meeting. But I promise you that I will immediately inform you about one date, which I think is of interest of everyone today attending the meeting because the Bureau of the World Heritage Committee will meet today. And I hope that we uh, get the date for the upcoming World Heritage Committee meeting. So I will, <laughs> as I, I promise you to, in, um, to inform you as soon as possible. I wish uh, the dig digital meeting today all every success and thank you very much again for inviting me. Thank you very much, Ms. Ringvik, for uh, your kind address. Thank you very much and good luck for the rest of the day for you. So as uh, our um, uh, last speaker of this opening uh, speeches round, I'm very pleased to have Christian Bieber among us. He's the president of the European Institute of Cultural Roots um, of the Council of Europe um, in Luxembourg. And we are also very honored to have you with us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, thank you very much, Madam Executive Director, ladies and gentlemen. It is great pleasure for me to be here with you on this third European Thermal Heritage Day. And it's a great honor to speak here in presence of the distinguished representative, Madame Lord Mayor of Baden-Baden, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Klaus Wolf, and uh, of course, Dr. Brigitte Ringbeck, uh, whom I know very well, uh, who is the chair of the Large Partial Agreement. And I'm very grateful uh, to the president of the European Historic Thermal Towns, uh, Mr. Manuel Baltar, and to you, uh, Mrs. Simone Zagrodnik, uh, for inviting me uh, to take the floor. Uh, my warm greetings to all the members of the European Route of Historic Thermal Town and also a special welcome to a new member uh, very dear to us, uh, namely the town of uh, mondorf les bains from Luxembourg. As chairman of the European Institute of Cultural Roots, I would like to say a few words about uh, our work and also uh, the program of Cultural Roots. 
the Institute of Culture Root is a technical agency of the Culture Root program of the Council of Europe. It was established in uh, 1998 in the framework uh, with a framework uh, between Luxembourg and the Council of Europe. And the Institute assists all the candidate root networks in the certification process and it provides support to the large partial agreement um, for the certification cycle. It also provides support uh, to all the certified culture routes of the Council of Europe through regular monitoring and meetings and also with the organization of an annual training academy and an annual forum. The network of the European route of historic Thermal Town was first certified in 2010 and it is a very active member of the cultural route program and we are very, very happy about that. Uh, you are implementing innovative initiatives in the field of research, enhancement of European heritage, youth involvement, artistic practice and sustainable cultural and tourism development. Founded by six members, you have now a total of 46 members across 18 countries, including Germany and Luxembourg. Congratulations for such a ach uh, remarkable achievement. And as I said before, I'm particularly pleased that also the city of Mont of Le Bain from Luxembourg has joined the network this year in June. Despite uh, the impact of the pandemic on the development of the activities that are planned this year, our institute has continued to provide ongoing support to the Cultural Roots Programme. It has ensured the smooth running of the certification cycle of candidates and also guaranteed to organize online training seminars for candidates. The Institute had also organized last month here in Luxembourg an exhibition uh, highlighting the seven cultural routes that cross Luxembourg and of course among them also year route of the European historic Thermal Town. The cultural route of the Council of Europe is a very successful program. It has now 40 certified routes and we have already 16 new applications for candidates for the next year evaluation cycle. So this really shows a growing interest in our program and its relevance at the European level. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very proud to have EFTA as part of the Cultural Roots program. And I would like to thank the representatives and members of the European Route of Historic Thermal Towns for your commitment and all the activities carried out and for your continuous support to the program. And it is also great to see that despite the pandemic we have, that an event like this could take place. Even though it's a pity that we are not in Baden-Baden, but uh, we do the best out of it. So I wish you an excellent and fruitful meeting and I hope also that I will be able to welcome you in Luxembourg where we have the European Institute of Cultural Roots maybe during one of our events next year in 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Beaver. Um, so thanks again to all of you that have been sharing um, these introduction words with us and um, giving us a diverse uh, perspectives already um, about this very precious and uh, special theme of uh, thermal heritage and the cultural roots uh, in general and um, our association. So um, now it's time that we uh, shift to the practical part. And um, as you have learned from the program already, we are really happy to have um, very interesting uh, presenters and um, speakers um, and panelists later on. and. Um, just as the idea um, and what I said uh, before, um, this European Thermal Heritage Day um, is uh, focusing on thermal architecture. And um, of course there is a thermal heritage and there are so many precious, precious places as we heard before all over Europe. Um, so um, the presentations that you are now going to see are uh, coming from first from a more global perspective and um, our vice president of the scientific committee Mario Crescente will um, give you first a more global perspective on thermal architecture explaining why um, we all think that uh, this really deserves a very specific um, 
look and um, yeah, more attention to this topic. Um, Paul Simons later on as the Secretary General of the Great Spas of um, Europe World Heritage Site Candidature will give you um, a closer look on those 11 candidates and their outstanding thermal architecture. And uh, then breaking it down here to the German and especially Baden-Baden point of view, um, Andreas Förderer will later on give you um, the aspects of Baden-Baden and uh, he's from the World Heritage um, uh, he's World Heritage and Tourism Expert at the Chamber of Commerce here in Karlsruhe. So um, I would now just like to give the floor to you, um, Mario, as our Vice President and um, also the man behind the scenes of this Thermal Heritage Day. Good morning. Thank you, Simone. Good morning. Uh, please, I, if we could see our presentation, then I began to talk over the slides. I'm beginning to thank very much and welcome to Baden-Baden, virtually. The image that you see is the dome of the Friedrich Bad in Baden-Baden. Imagine you are there taking a bath and then everything seems to be on the way, not as we are here. Thermal greetings to everybody and special greetings to Mr. Mar Margaret Mergren, the mayor of Baden-Baden, to host the event. Our president, Manuel Baltar, Professor Wolf and Ms. Fingerbeck and especially also to our Galician origin friend, Christian Bivier, to be with us today opening the session. Uh, next slide, please, Simone. We began with a short background because Simone told the story about this event. Remember European Year of Cultural Heritage 18, and from Ourense to the European Parliament and to different meetings with European Heritage Alliance, where HTTA is part, we decided to take the jump to another uh, level on the co communication and presentation of the Thermal Heritage, creating this idea of the European Year of Cultural Heritage, moved by the Scientific Committee, and that we celebrate today. Next slide, please, Simone. Uh, the first ever European Thermal Heritage Day was celebrated in Budapest with the support of the European Commissioner, Mr. Tibor Navracic celebrated the 100th anniversary of the amazing Geller Bats. Later in the, the same year, the institute that uh, Christian Bieber pre, uh, represented here gave us the Bex Prizes Practices in Cultural and Sustainable Tourist Award by the Council of Europe on the occasion of the ninth Annual Advisory Forum on Cultural Roots in Sibiu in Romania, you see. The, the, the award there, and it was an honor for us to receive that for the idea of this European Thermal Heritage Day. In 2019, in Spa in Belgium, with a great support from Isabel and his team, we celebrate another with the aim of what Spa, Spa as a concept to be redefined in the perfect place to discuss that in Spa. Remember, Salus per Aqua don't exist, what exists is the town, our town member Spa. Next slide, Simone, please. Well, we jump here to the European Thermal Heritage Day in 2020 that will examine the subject of thermal architecture. Baden-Baden was originally selected as the perfect place in which to talk about thermal architecture. And we could resume that in three reasons. Firstly, the physical proof of the tradition from the German interest in thermalists and thermal spaces. Secondly, Baden-Baden located in a region historically dedicated to health and wellness. And last but not least, the town's impressive architecture spans the millennia from the Roman origins to the beginnings of the contemporary art. Talking about these Roman origins, here I present a Roman architectonical example on the Banero de Lugo, Galicia, Spain, that we studied with my colleague, the archaeologist Silvia Gonzalez Sotelo and we develop in a, a intensive research about how from the beginning of these Roman times, we could achieve today a new way of living in our thermal times. The objective of this meeting is that the Scientific Committee of ETSTA invites everyone to recognize the phenomenon of this common heritage, because only when it is shared and valued by the community, can it be saved, preserved, or enhanced. A related and equally interesting discussion could be has if it's possible to separate architecture and urbanism, but neither time nor space allow that here. It is hoped that a future event based around the subject of thermal towns and urbanism will be held in Saratoga Springs, Ciudad, in 21, 
We hope it. Next slide, please. Coming to the thermal architecture, you remember the title of this presentation with the question, does thermal architecture exist? Examining different legislation in different countries represented by the EDGE world, it can be seen at different levels of appreciation and recognition of thermal heritage. From local to regional and national levels, thermal buildings are listed as monuments of historical significance, local, regional, national importance by municipalities, region or states. The great example of that is the city of Bath in the UK, itself a whole city inscribed in the World Heritage List for its architecture and setting. What we have to remember here is that this, when we talk about this thermal heritage, we talk about that very complex concept where natural resources, cultural resources, and intangible resources are part of them. Next slide, please. Here we present an example in Orense. This is the altar from the Roman Burgas in Orense. If we talk about that, we have to remember that the waters in Orense are 15,000 years old. And the original Roman baths are from the first century before Christ. And the fountain we see today are from the 17th century. Where is here the value on the 15,000 years on the first century or in the building we know from the 16th? This complexity is what we want to present here. And this complexity evolved later in the use of the water from the monastic bath that is spread all over Europe, the patronage of different orders connected sometimes with the way of St. James that we talked before. Next slide, please. Here in 1820, Elisenbrunner was built by Schinkel in Asla Chapelle, today Aachen. This town, as I see before, I said before, is on the way of St. James, supported by Carolus and connecting Germany and Galicia over the way, and maybe creating the interest of pilgrims in thermal baths along the route. This connection from Germany to Galicia crossing the whole Europe in a, the first cultural route itinerary that Mr. Christian Bieber presented before could be the origin of the literature, guides, and tourists. And we came to tourists, these tourists that expanded across Europe, receiving a massive boost in the middle of the 19th century with the coming of the railway network of railways that connect the widely dispersed European thermal towns. We arrived to the 19th century and I get some words from Mark Twain in Baden-Baden when he said, here at the Friedrich path, you lose track of time with 10 minutes and track of the world within 20 minutes. Next slide, please. And we jump to this place. We are now in Baden-Baden. If we talk about types and functions in architecture, maybe this example could be one of the of the best. By the 19th century, the Kurhaus became a recognized leisure building signal, signal at this moment when thermal architecture can be described as established architectural genre. Kurhaus could be one of these types that define thermal architecture, but we could talk about another types. Trink halles, baths, casinos, thermal hotels, villas, parks, gardens, cable cars, funiculas, Etc. contribute to create the rich panorama of the ther thermal architectonical types. Maybe on the beginning, on the complexity of the Roman thermal buildings is a reminder of the difference between two types of buildings, the thermae, using ordinary water for recreation, and the balnea, using thermal water for health and perhaps even worship and spiritual cleansing. This origin brought us to the dichotomy between health and relax. Health that manage a very precious resources, thermal waters with a complex management and relax, talking about the image and the connection with tourists. Next slide, please, Simone. Then we jump from the types to the form. And I want to make the point on the complexity of the original Roman thermal windies. And I give you some example, the St. Philip's Martyrium in Gerapolis, Turkey, or here in a church in the St. Mary de la Salute in Venezia, where you could see the image here on the left. 
we could jump from this idea of centralized architecture in a fantastic example on the Wojciech Sanatorium Bad Complex in Ladek Throck in Poland, previously known as Bad Landek. The building you see on the right with this photo is for us the small thermal Vatican when the centralized architecture focused in the thermal water in the circular pool in the center of the building present this idea. Remember also the centralized model connected with the Aachen Fountain of Schinkel that we see previously. Another question we open here is if it's possible to propose that thermal architecture is a variant of model of centralized architecture, could it be? This hypothesis is illustrated in the map that you could see at the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. We enter here, finally, this presentation talking about discussions. The first discussion should examine the name itself. Could, we be, could it be thermal architecture that we defend based on the Congress on Thermal Tourism for the United World Tourist Organization from 1999 and 2010? and also defended by the use of the ISO standards, or could be a spa architecture. Its contemporary sense, in many cases, the wrong term of is creating misunderstanding because it's related to very different type of buildings, not always using thermal water, not always connected with the uh, thermal tanks we use. Discussions about a complex heritage with natural, cultural, intangible values, with local perceptions and specific values, and feelings show that it's important that all of these values and nuances can be appreciated in translation of different languages, but more studies, I think, are needed in this area. We couldn't finish this discussion of the panorama of the thermal architecture. Uh, it, it could be not complete if we don't make any mention to the contemporary thermal architecture. Cases as Thumtor in Bal, Switzerland, Jean Nouvel in Dax, France, Nicholas Grishon in Bath, UK, and Fuxas in Montecatini are rethinking and reinventing thermal architecture while generating new models for the future, but based on the tradition of more than 2,000 years of working with waters and constructing architectonical types. Next slide, please. Thank you, Simone. Conclusions. Here we present with this map part of this conclusion. The principal objective of the celebration of this European Thermal Heritage Day and the pollution of a small book in the next future is, first of all, recognize that the European significance of the thermal architecture. Second, show that it's a remarkable and unique European phenomenon as many of our opening speeches was presented. And finally, highlight the existence of thermal architecture all over Europe. Thermal architecture was originally a European phenomenon, an ancient one that, that, but in more recent times, it has spread it all over the world with fantastic examples, maybe in Rotorua, New Zealand, or maybe in Saratoga Springs, New York State, South America, we hope to visit next year. In Western Europe, recognition of this architecture as a specific heritage is underway, but there is a risk of losing many important examples of thermal architecture in the Eastern and Southern Europe through neglect or inappropriate improvements that are superimposed over the rich built heritage that already exists. The renaissance of thermal towns is another good area of future study. The map of maps that you see in the screen is a selection of the most important buildings in Europe connected with extra, extra thermal architecture towns all of these buildings are drawing at the same scale with the same orientation with north, north on the top, and to provide a comparison of form, plant, structure, and in the next future, depurate with temperature, waters, and uses of the different buildings. The COVID-19, okay, uh, are globally, has impacted tourists in the thermal town sector and led to a serious debate about how to recover from the economic crisis that has resulted from the pandemic. Architecture and urbanist buildings and towns are all having to be rethought along with so many aspects of tourists, especially the safe management of large groups of people. Sustainability of tourists and economies will be at the hair of possible solutions to the current crisis and transport solutions will be a key part of that. Remember next year we celebrate the European year of rail in Europe 2021. 
The original promise offered by the thermal towns and the surrounding landscapes that can be used for exercise and well-being is one hope for recovery, both in terms of physical and mental health, but also for tourists and economy. These places had survived pandemics in the past and have been destination of health since Roman times and sometimes before. They can also be part of the future of health and well-being and their longevity and unique proposition all wrapped up in stunning thermal architectural should remain a draw for generations to come. The next European Thermal Heritage Day in 2021 will focus on urbanism and thermal landscape, therapeutic landscape, say my colleague Paul. In one year, perhaps the worldwide will have recovered, we hope, from the pandemic and conditions will, will be more favorable for a physical meeting we desire and hope. I want to finish say, giving a special thanks to Simone, Lisa and Catherine, and also to my colleague Paul for the support to develop that, that this was imagined sometimes, and today is really true, real. Thank you very much. See you there, I see you in Saratoga. Bye. Thank you, Mario, for sharing this. And um, now we are looking at the great spas of Europe and uh, welcome and good morning, Paul Simons. Uh, thank you, Simone. Um, uh, Mr. President, uh, Lord Mayor Mergen, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, my colleagues and friends in the thermal architecture world. Uh, Mario has given us a um, perspective of where we are now uh, in terms of the consideration of thermal heritage. And I would like to give you some uh, specific examples of that as we start to look at the range of architecture we find in the thermal towns. So if my presentation could come up, please. Um, I would like to start with the first slide. Here we have a list of those 11 spa towns that are forming the nomination that's been mentioned concerning the great spas of Europe to UNESCO. And just like Dr. Ringbeck has mentioned, I'm also on the edge of my seat today as I await a decision from Paris concerning the date when our uh, nomination will be considered in the future. Um, these towns uh, have been brought together following an extensive research across Europe uh, through a, a comparative analysis of over 600 known spa towns that existed in the 19th century. And while selecting the most representative group, we've been through a very exhaustive process and ended up with uh, this a group of 11 towns from seven countries uh, listed there. I won't read them all out, but I'm about to try and show you the best examples of a range of architecture from each one of these places. So I've tried to define the different categories of spa architecture. So could we have the next slide, please? Um, uh, here we have a, a categorization that we've used in the nomination to UNESCO uh, to show the range of thermal architecture. And I think the categories are important because it starts with very distinct uh, thermal buildings that house the spa functions themselves. And so we have a, a sort of grade uh, of in buildings in the spa towns from the most important through to those that support the functions and associated with the functions of a spa town and the infrastructure that it needs to be able to uh, fulfill those activities. And um, therefore we start very much with the buildings that house the springs, the very essence of spa towns is the natural occurrence of uh, thermal uh, water, mineral waters, and how we uh, control and manage those through springs, fountains and pavilions, and then how that water is then put into other functions in baths, uh, in pump rooms for drinking, in, 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 uh, for inhalation as well, um, and that these buildings uh, are reflected in different types of functional architecture. At the same time, we also have meeting rooms where the, uh, those gathering at spa towns could, could meet uh, and continue uh, their daily routines other than just drinking and bathing all the time. We then have uh, spa related functions. These we often call the diversions where people uh, had to find other activities to keep them occupied whilst visiting spa towns that involved ga gaming, playing cards in coffee houses, or even gambling in casinos. 
It resulted in the theatres and concert halls, music pavilions being built to occupy those functions. And also in the landscapes, we find a great deal of landscape activity through the parks and gardens, uh, but also uh, we have activities in those such as tennis and golf clubs emerging as very early features of spas. Related to that is the architecture that then houses guests from hotels and villas as lodging, uh, religious buildings to express the wide range of religious beliefs of visitors to spa towns, and the tolerance in spa towns to enable uh, all those religions to be practiced, uh, and also uh, things like boutiques and shopping and souvenir activity and the creation of souvenirs occurred in the spa towns as well. And then all those functions have to be supported uh, through uh, backup buildings such as laboratories and pharmacies for the medical functions, mineral water bottling, the production of mineral salts, uh, peat was used, mud baths, and then the uh, enable, enabling visitors to come to the spa towns when they expanded enormously in the 19th century with the advent of the railways, uh, the railway stations, and other very functional things like laundries, market gardens, etc. So if we can move on to the examples, please, with the, uh, the next uh, slide. And so following that hierarchy uh, of main uh, uh, thermal architecture through to the very functional, um, this hierarchy would include the springs at the very uh, heart of our spa towns, the very raison d'etre for why these towns exist. And uh, I'm just giving you a whole range of examples today. It shows not only the quality of architecture that existed in our great spa towns, uh, the quality, the uh, wide variety of architectural styles used and the great architects employed to create them. But at the same time, these buildings are functional. Uh, architects, uh, many of you in the audience, we all know that form follows function and the function of these buildings dictates the type of architecture that they are and creates uh, a distinct thermal architecture. And I totally support Mario's uh, thesis that there is a distinct uh, architectural genre called thermal architecture. Next slide, please. Uh, I apologize as I now have to uh, rush through uh, a series of slides, just giving you a, a sample and a flavor of this wide variety uh, of, of architectural styles and types, but all housing similar functions. So here we have uh, a Moroccan uh, a style, an Islamic style of architecture being used in Vichy to house the thermal baths uh, and a contrasting uh, one in Bad Kissingen. Uh, so this is the next tier down from the springs. We now have the water being used in buildings for bathing, for water treatments, for massage and the vast range of other treatments that we're now aware of. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, following on from that, there is the drinking halls. We call them pump rooms, drinking halls, trinkhalle. They are uh, numerous in all spa towns and again, vary enormously from this almost Art Deco inspired uh, uh, hall in Vichy, uh, an iron frame building to uh, the great structure in uh, Bad Kissingen, uh, a 1920s building, reinforced concrete, uh, using modern construction techniques in order to, to build a very large drinking hall indeed where many people could be served to take their daily dose of the mineral waters. Next slide please. Moving on from that we then move out into the towns themselves. Once uh, guests had used the uh, thermal waters it had been applied to them or they bathed in it um, they used to go out and promenade. Walking exercise was uh, uh, prescribed by the doctors in the spa towns uh, to move around constantly when drinking the water and to take as much exercise as possible that people were not doing uh, back in their cities and their towns in their workplaces. They were becoming increasingly unhealthy throughout the 18th and 19th century. And here we have uh, a common feature of all our spa towns, colonnades, covered walkways uh, to take that exercise. An absolutely magnificent example in Mariansky Lazny, this great iron frame colonnade built on a very gentle curve. It's a very clever architectural device and is a most beautiful building. And the contrasting that, the use of the classical style, which is commonly found in our spa towns, uh, again, the mill colonnade, running alongside the river in the middle of Carlo Vivari. Next slide, please. And we move on to then areas where people could meet. 
assembly rooms. Assembly rooms where you would go after you'd taken your daily treatment and your exercise, you would go to meet people, to socialize, to take coffee, to take lunch, to play cards, to dance in the afternoons, uh, and to really generally socialize. And this is where the assembly, the assembly of spa guests met uh, in these rooms. And here are two examples, a uh, classical building uh, in, in the city of Bath, where I'm currently located, the World Heritage City, uh, as Mario mentioned, and the equivalent uh, of an assembly room, uh, a very ornate building, uh, incredible interiors, the Vauxhall in Spa in Belgium. Next slide, please. And as we expand that range of activities that uh, the assembly could participate in, we call these uh, other activities diversions, how you divert the attention of your guests to keep them occupied. Clearly, uh, I'm not going to talk about the one on the left. You're going to see and hear a lot more about that during the day. The famous Cure House and now housing the casino in Baden-Baden. And next to it, also in Germany, in Bad Ems, uh, the casino building, but here a great complex uh, on the riverbank of the River Lahn, uh, the Kursaal houses, the casino, which is nearest to us, in the middle is the theatre, and at the far end there is the assembly rooms. So here you have a great architectural ensemble, uh, very, very prominent uh, in a key site along the river, housing not only the assembly rooms and the theatre, but also the casino as well. Next slide, please. And as well as that, we have theatres such as uh, the very French inspired design in Carlo Vivari, the Municipal Theatre, and an Art Nouveau inspired theatre in Baden by Wien in, in Austria. And this summer arena, as it's called, had the first retractable roof of any theatre in Europe and could be opened in the very fine weather during uh, the summer season. Next slide, please. Going on to hotels and lodging houses, here we have a great, great hotel on the left in Bad Ems, which was actually the medieval castle and then two palaces for the Dukes of Nassau and Orange. And then it became a five star hotel, but it's still located where the springs are based. And on the right, the equivalent of the new spa hotel, a grand spa that housed czars, kings and queens and princes of all over Europe in Mariansky Lazny. Next slide, please. And excuse me, as well as hotels, uh, we have villas built for regular aristocratic visits. Uh, the villas are of an incredible range of style and design in all our spa towns. On the left, uh, built for Napoleon III's visits to Vichy. Uh, and on the right, uh, a great uh, neo-Gothic uh, neo uh, construction in Baden by Wien for the aristocracy and the wealth, uh, wealthy of uh, Vienna uh, moving out to the spa town. Next slide, please. We have mentioned religious buildings. And just to show the range here, we have a Russian Orthodox on the left in Carlo Bavari. We have uh, uh, an Orthodox church here in the middle of Baden-Baden. Uh, on the hill overlooking the town, and on the right, a further Greek Orthodox church in Frantiskovi Lazny. Uh, these religions were tolerated and were accepted in all our spa towns, and the great range of chapels is remarkable. Next slide, please. And the infrastructure. I won't describe what all these buildings are, but they illustrate visitor attractions, archaeology, souvenir shops, funicular railway, craft shops, a laundry building, a salts building, and an abattoir, the most remarkable abattoir I've ever seen in Bad Kissingen. This is just a short range, a small range of all those buildings that supported the function of the spa towns. Um, next slide, please. And, and to get to the end, Mario mentioned the continuing living tradition of our spa towns over the centuries that are able to reinvent themselves whenever they need to and move forward. And, and that is a great feature of the towns. We have Grimshaw's architecture on the left in Bath. Uh, the middle slide shows the Leopolding Baths in uh, Montecatini Terme, and the, now we're having the Fuxas scheme implemented there. Below that is the current scheme being implemented in, in Spa. And on the right, the, the Richard Meyer building in Baden-Baden, which again, you will, will, you will hear more of 
I'm sure, shortly. Uh, I think that's the final slide. I don't know if there's another one, uh, but I'd just like to uh, say in rushing through, uh, rushing through this uh, talk this morning, I'm sorry I've had to be so quick, but I thought it was really important to give you an illustration of the vast range of architect architectural styles and types that we have in the spa towns and what a great example they are in illustrating that range that is a clear illustration of what is thermal architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, yeah, you also referred to Mario. Thanks for the both of you really giving us a great introduction on a very interesting, interesting uh, theme this morning. And I think now also the audience understands uh, much better what the, what the thermal architecture is all about and that this today is only really a short spotlight on everything. Um, so um, I hope we have so far made many of you out there uh, very curious um, on yeah how to follow and uh, to follow the rest of the program. Um, now coming from really these uh, great general perspectives um, to the town that is hosting us here today. Um, I'd like to welcome now Mr. Andreas Förderer. Um, he will talk about the thermal architecture of Baden-Baden especially. And um, good morning, Andreas. I hope you Hello. can hear me. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Good morning. Okay. So I start. Yes. Uh, yes. Since 2000 years, thermal water in Baden-Baden never changed its content. What changed was the use of it and its social function. If you look today at these people drinking thermal water three times a day for a whole month in the Baden-Baden drinking hall, you are as far away from practices in the 19th century as these people were away from the Romans using the same hot water for their sauna-like bathing. In my view, the evolution of the so-called thermal architecture is not so much a history of changing styles or of evolving building types, but a history of changing mindsets, leading to changing functions and transforming the whole spa town around. Next slide. Architecture linked to the appearance of thermal water is always architecture linked to a very specific situation. And Baden-Baden is a perfect example for that. Um, the geographical situation, the historical situation, um, fashion, the evolution of public transports, ac architectural styles, the political situation, medical developments, investments, single personalities, everything played and still plays a role. The first idea may be Thermal architecture is where the hot springs come directly to the surface. But like in many other cases in Baden-Baden, this is not binding. You can see on the uh, map on the left side, the old spa district where the springs are. At the departure of the blue arrows, um, you have the Florentina Berg with the springs and you have it illustrated on the aerial view at the right side. Here, thermal architecture is concentrated, starting with the Roman findings up to the modern thermal bath. But already at the beginning of the 19th century, thermal water was then transported outside the old town in wooden tubes to other places at the drinking hall in the new spa district or hotels. That's where the um, arrows go. Uh, next slide. Hello, my name is Andreas Förderer. I was for many years involved in the Great Spas of Europe project. And I have to, the pleasure to show you now in the following minutes, some examples of thermal architecture in Baden-Baden. Next slide. As Paul already explained, we had for the nomination dossier, Great Spas of Europe, developed a differentiation for the ensemble of buildings in a spa town. And I will follow this scheme um, because within 1,500 listed cultural monuments in Baden-Baden, you have some 15 outstanding buildings, not all of them directly linked to thermal water, but at least from the beginning of the 19th century, most of them are in direct connection to the spa town 
as a living and evolving organism around thermal springs. I will now mainly focus on the buildings connected to curative waters. Next slide. We start with Roman findings, which are documented in two areas near the Stiftskirche, right in the city, uh, in the old city center, near Friedrichsbad. Um, other findings have been made, but it's likely that the city lies over other Roman rests we don't know yet dating back um, at least to the first century. Next slide. These are important ruins and finds, but it seems that it was not an exceptional Roman bath in Baden-Baden like those in Italy, Bath or Trave. Next slide. As the town was burnt down by the troops of Louis XIV in 1689, there is little evidence in architecture to the medieval use of thermal waters in Baden-Baden. But we have the written sources telling about life in several bathhouses in the town. Next slide. In the 17th century, the Margrave of Baden built a representative bathroom, the so-called princely bath, but we know little about its use and function in the new castle, um, which is lying in the direct neighborhood of the springs. It had more representative functions than the real bathing function. Next slide. It is right at the beginning of the 19th century in 1804 that a curious building was erected nearby the castle. Um, it had been destroyed some decades later to build um, Friedrichsbad. It was called museum and had a mixed function. Looking like a small temple, you have in the main room in the middle, the Roman finds of excavations already made at the end of the 18th century. And at the left side, you had a small drinking hall and at the right side of the main hall, you had a kind of showroom for the main source. It is like a sanctuary for the thermal water of Baden-Baden and its history, restarting the identity of Baden-Baden as a spa town. I think this pseudo-religious role of thermal water is important for the secularized 19th century, as Mario also noticed um, in his um, contribution. Next slide. It is only in 1839 when the Trinkhalle was built, drinking hall, with the construction of the Kurhaus before the social venues of the spa towns were already put outside the old town. So the drinking hall being a combination of source pavilion far away from the source. I showed you that um, before. Um, the water had been transported here. Uh, so this combination of a source pavilion and covered gallery has also a kind of representative function for the thermal water as a genius locky. Its big staircase, its sanctuary-like main room, all is a little bit too big even if the drinking cure was fashionable and crowds had to be managed. If in all the new leisure facilities, the thermal water was missing and as the spa town was getting the image of a new society, thermal water was and rests for the whole 19th century, the turning point of the spa town, somehow like it was the church in the middle of a medieval town. Next slide. It is important to know that the prohibition of gaming in the German Empire, 1871, caused a problem for the financing of Baden-Baden. This led to a big investment and to an architecture where the societal role of the spa is strongly visible. You see the Friedrichsbad, a palace-like building of enormous size with big staircases, public rooms, and many features which are not which are not necessary for a public bath. It was planned between 1869 and 1877 by Karl Dernfeld, a local architect 
who had seen the Roman Therme in Italy and contemporary Bath in Budapest, Carlo Vivari and Vichy. Next slide. Here you have some insights of the Friedrichsbad in its time, showing it like a mixture of theater and stage, illustrating the societal role of thermal architecture. From the Trinkhalle as a stage for the emancipated bourgeoisie, you come here to a palace for the individual body where individual persons are caring for their body. This is also a changing mindset at the end of the um, 19th century. Next slide. While Friedrichsbad is still today running, some other buildings in connection to the thermal water have been replaced by newer ones, the latest being the Caracalla Therme built in 1983. See at the right side. Next slide. I come now to the so-called buildings for leisure and pleasure, the Kurhaus, which seems to be a prototype of thermal architecture as was showed in the um, other contributions already. The Kurhaus built 1821 to 25 by the local architect Friedrich Weinbrenner um, seems to be a prototype of thermal architecture but sorry, there is no thermal water in this Kurhaus. Also, other cure houses at other spa towns had integrated springs, drinking halls, etc. But this Kurhaus is at first just a multifunctional building, integrating a choice of leisure time facilities. At the beginning, there was a restaurant, a reading room, a dancing hall, and a theater were gathered. Uh, in, in this building gathered. Next slide. With the arriving of the Parisian Benazé family, gambling became predominant, leading to the replacement of the theater by a casino in the fashionable Napoleon III style, still running today as a casino. At least here, the influence of international guests on the shape of the thermal architecture is evident altering thermal water from the big point of attraction to one of many features of the thermal microcosm. Next slide. The Benassé family did not hesitate to invest the money gained with the casino in a new theater built nearby by Parisian architect Charles Couteau. They invested in spectacular representations and concerts as well, knowing that the healing effects of thermal water did not always fulfill the promises given. Next slide. In Baden-Baden, hotels, guest houses and villas are in direct connection to the nucleus of the spa town. They are not only a private space or private spaces, but they are complementary to the spa infrastructure. In the case of the Grand Hotels and the prestigious villas, they form themselves microcosms in the bigger microcosm of the spa town. And so you find, for example, in the Badischer Hof Hotel, uh, from the beginning, uh, direct uh, thermal water in the rooms, which was a big attraction. Um, and in this hotel, they had uh, own park and reading room. So it was like, a small spa town in the spa town. Next slide. Another facet of Baden-Baden are the churches of various faiths reflecting not only the needs of international guests and citizens in Baden-Baden, but demonstrating and affirming for every visitor the mindset of Baden-Baden as a mecca for a tolerant, open-minded society. The curative effects and attraction of thermal water being the same for everyone were celebrated as the link between all kinds of nations and faith and thus generating the spa experience as a proto-European one. Next slide. 
and last slide. I hope you noticed that I'm not a fan of the idea of special building types of thermal architecture. Nevertheless, the example of Baden-Baden shows how the existence of thermal water and its use over centuries influenced the mix of buildings in a spa town. Beginning latest in the 18th century with forerunners like bath and spa, the use of thermal water was getting more and more just one element of a holistic spa experience. So what is interesting in my view in thermal architecture is not only the evolution of buildings directly connected to thermal water, the evolution of spa towns being itself a type of architecture or settlement with a very special mix of different single buildings together with multifunctional buildings and together with the connecting walking parks, path, parks and gardens. Altogether, they form a functional ensemble um, and with an emphasis on public spaces, inside, outside, and so on. In this vision, architectural styles and building types seem to be only arbitrary options in an evolving organism. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andreas. And um, with your words and your presentation, we are um, closing this uh, first part um, of um, sharing the practical um, examples with all of us. And um, I am now uh, trying to see if one of you has some questions to one of our three uh, presenters um, about the examples on uh, thermal architecture and or maybe just uh, share your thought because we have heard now the examples, we have heard words and um, expressions like thermal micro, um, microcosm um, or um, um, just relating what Mario said, um, the continuing living architecture and spa towns re-eventing -even themselves. So if you just would like to share with all of us your thoughts, um, your questions, you're very welcome to do so. I'm just checking in the chat if one of you has dropped a question there. Anyone? I'm just looking around. Everybody has followed, no questions. Okay, I don't see any. All right. Well, you're just collecting and maybe we have later a, a bigger session. So um, if I'm just looking around now for our roundtable group, who is about to share with us now the challenges of um, having a thermal architecture and uh, an important site and maybe even a World Heritage Site uh, to manage. Um, I'm just looking around um, while you all get your cameras on. Um, I'm just a little bit shifting. So um, our next uh, part in our uh, European Thermal Heritage Day today is uh, the round table and I'm really pleased and happy that we have now um, a great group together uh, that is going to share with us um, their experiences and then later on also um, exchange among each other to, together with Professor Dor Dr. Jörg Haspel, president of Ecomos Germany. Um, we are very happy to have you with us. And um, as you have prepared um, with all of us, the managing thermal architecture and generating community support, um, I think this is really going to be very interesting. Um, the opening speeches have referred already to um, the community support. And this is why I would really like to give the floor to all of you now, um, together with uh, Professor Haspel, we have Anke Mattis from uh, Vichy, um, our colleague, we have Lucy Sokhorokova from um, Kalovivari, we have Lisa Pöchki here in Baden-Baden, Professor Mengele also here in Baden-Baden, and Anna Baker from Bath. So. Um, have a good round table. This is um, all I can say from my part now. And um, thanks for having you here. Yes, thank, thank you very much. And welcome everybody here for this uh, round table discussion 
on uh, European thermal heritage uh, architecture. Uh, I, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers who give this introductory speeches uh, to the topic of our discussion this morning. I think it was very interesting and very informative for all of us. And so we feel very well prepared for our discussion. And, and the second part is, I would like to congratulate the initiative for the World Heritage nomination, but first of all, the initiative to create this municipal network of thermal cities and towns in, on a European level. I think it's a fantastic interim result of the World Heritage Initiative and also for celebrating this European Heritage Day uh, in autumn uh, annually. I think that's a big advantage and a big success for the whole initiative, even if it's not yet inscribed in the World Heritage List. So thank you very much. I, I would like to start with the example from France with uh, Anke Matisse, who is the, I can't see him, but he is, ah, yes. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, he is the executive assistant of the city project department in Vichy and site manager of the World Heritage nomination for Vichy. So he is uh, the French part of this initiative and the floor is yours, Anke. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for this uh, invitation. I would like through this uh, few minutes uh, to show uh, the tension we must manage when it comes to preserving, um, sorry, when it comes to preserving the thermal heritage and its remarkable architecture in a medium-sized city like Vichy. I arrived in the city in Vichy, of Vichy in 2016 to coordinate locally uh, on a technical level the nomination dossier for the Great Spa of Europe and to prepare the local management plan. The municipality worked a lot over the past 25 years for the preservation and enhancement of Vichy thermal heritage. We are going to continue this work, but certainly in another way today or with another intensity with other cards in hand, if I can say so, which is why I must recall in a few words what has been done. Uh, if you can put uh, the next slide with the map. Yeah, this one. Much had been done first to renovate public spaces in order to give more space to pedestrian. And we will continue this work to calm the thermal heart of the circulation, in particular around the spring park. The so spring park on, on the photo, it's a red triangle uh, in the middle of, uh, of the, the spa town. So why I'm going to talk about cars when it's about architecture? <laughs> because reducing traffic, uh, uh, car traffic is essential to, in order to appreciate without reasons its urban environments, beautiful eclectic facade that lines the parks and the main avenues. So I remind you that Spa Town was designed, uh, organized uh, on a pedestrian scale and that it must remain so. It isn't necessary to be able to continue uh, to, to walk around uh, in peace under the gallery of the park, which are a remarkable and singular example of this thermal architecture. So I see some reaction, but it was not for me. Okay. <laughs> but now we are facing one of the first tension in terms of management. I will give an example. In the weeks and months to come, we will finally become the owner of the spring sparks and more generally of the thermal domain, which includes the springs, the bath, the brands on cosmetics, mineral waters, etc. Without waiting for the official signing of the sale, we launched a competition for the restoration of the park. It's in progress. The question um, that naturally arises is to reduce the presence of the car around the park, which we would, of course, like to do. But now the surrounding historic buildings that are renovated cannot be marketed, are hard to sell, precisely because they do not have a private parking space. And if we want to, if we want the architecture of these beautiful immutable buildings to be preserved, we need them to be inhabited. So we will have to find a happy medium or progressive tempo to succeed in reconciling the two. 
So it was just a, a first example. Secondly, much has been done to rehabilitate the built heritage through several operations of reconversion of historic thermal building, always based on the restoration of the heritage, such as, for example, the former large casino into a convention center, the former large thermal bath on, on a university pole, or the former large hotels into apartment buildings. In every case, the goal was to promote the facilities for the reception of visitors, regional neighborhood to tourism, business and congress tourism, sports tourism, teaching French to foreigners. So the public authorities are therefore largely intervened to give a second life to large emblematic buildings in order to preserve their architecture, while introducing a dose of modernity. We are going to continue this work on the last two great monuments that remain, the springs part of which I spoke on the um, I, I spoke and on the former first class spa establishment. So you saw a photo uh, with Paul um, just before with the, the dome, the very uh, mosque dome. So we are going to become the owner of this building and in, in which we wish to create a museographic space telling the story of Vichy, Queen of Spa Town. But we are therefore going to restore this historical monument uh, according to the rules, but by trying to introduce a dose of modernity into the less heritage era. For example, um, you know this, most of you, this, this kind of buildings. We have a floor made of entirely of all treatments rooms. It's very narrow, a line uh, on either side of, of a gallery. It's, it's beautiful. This alignment of cabins give you, gives off a strong atmosphere that allows you to protect, project yourself into what it was at that time. But how we are go, how we going to do uh, to exhibit works, you know, like in a museum in these very narrow cabins? So I don't know, the, I don't have the answer now. <laughs> it's a stimulating works awaits us in, in the coming years. So it's a new, a new example of this tension <laughs> for, for me. So, but not everything can be based on public intervention to preserve architecture. Residents and private owners must participate. So now I'm going to speak about this common heritage culture. If you can put the next slide, please. So, as you can see, uh, you can see this map uh, represents our heritage regulation called Outstanding Heritage Site. So as you can see, thermal heritage is based on a collection of buildings ranging from the thermal bath to villa, parks, hotels, and so on, with different architectural values, which are distributed in a relatively concentrated and current perimeter in, in Vichy. But it is this set that exudes exceptional values. So. For instance, if you look at the map, you have in black the historical monuments, exceptional buildings, new red, remarkable buildings with stripes, and interesting building in range. So now, by doing my job as a site manager and working around the city, I realize with other colleagues that the private owners with the craftsmen do not always renovate their property according to the rules in terms of heritage renovation practices. And therefore it was necessary to do education and communication around heritage, heritage regulation, good practices of heritage renovation, and give them financial resources while doing more control in the field. So many efforts have been done on social networks and in the city with the distribution of brochures, the organization of public meetings in order to make them proud of their heritage, but also aware of their res responsibility. So the objective of all this work is to make the inhabitants understand that the richness of the thermal architecture comes from the collection of all the villa and the buildings, which presents very eclectic architecture uh, in the case of, of Vichy, but it's the case also in other patterns, and that when one loses the integrity and the authenticity of a single one, or here or there, we lose the exceptional value of the wall. It's a long-term job that requires to show pedagogy with people who are sometimes more concerned about question of thermal comfort and budget savings rather than aesthetic questions. 
And some owners do not always know that their house or their building is identified in the heritage regulation and that consequently certain obligations must be respected when you redo your facade or change your windows. We really need to be able to quickly educate the owners because the municipality cannot do everything and especially because we have a built historical heritage inherited from the 19th century, which begins to come to the end of a cycle and to deteriorate. This is particularly the case for all the large hotels, buildings, which could lose in the coming years the decoration of the facade and therefore uh, authenticity if nothing is done upstream. That's why we have to develop this culture of preventive conservation internally with our monuments, the, the city, the municipality, but externally with the inhabitants' property. And on this issue, we are making good progress since we have recruited two heritage architects who have started a precise inventory of the conservation of the buildings in the thermal center and drew up advice sheets to explain in an educational way uh, what works must be declared and what are the good practices of conservation of historic buildings. And we have also created I mean, financial aid to renovate facade of buildings according to the heritage classification of the buildings. So different colors you, you have on the map, you, you can have a different kind of financial uh, aid. So to conclude, uh, I try to move all these things forward a, a bit like a lobbyist. Uh, I try to make all city departments aware of these uh, heritage issues. And, and for that, you have to know how to speak several languages because there are multiple paths to preserve the thermal architecture from the management of car traffic to the changing of windows through the programming of a museum in a former spa establishment classified as a historic monuments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anki, for this presentation and for sharing your experience in Vichy uh, with us. I, I think it was very uh, interesting. And I, I would like to add one question to you now, because you, you mentioned and introduced the, the term of preventive conservation or preventive preservation. And my question is, except of Bath, none of the 11 nominated heritage sites of thermal architecture of, of thermal heritage is inscribed in the World Heritage List. And when you are discussing this preventive measurements and discussion, is there somewhat like an, uh, an advisory body or like advisors for doing this concept, which is also preventing and preparing the World Heritage nomination as far as I understood. So is for example, Ecomos or others, are they included uh, as counselors in this whole strategy or do you wait and we'll see after the inscription how to involve other partners in the development. Well, we have nothing uh, really formalized as you, uh, you, you present uh, now. So, of course, we have some um, work with the state services uh, in charge of heritage, what in French we call architect of Bâtiment de France. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, of course, uh, they have something more formalized. But now, as you, we have nothing really, uh, we are working on it with the Great Spa right now. We are working to prepare a conference just uh, to, to get a system uh, shared between the 11th uh, Spa town of, of this nomination to, to have something. But uh, now we have to, it's really just the beginning. We are not in touch with uh, e-commerce right now at this stage. We are just trying to identify the issues and I mean to, to prepare the field and, and to make to, to know where we are now in order to facilitate uh, all, all this. So uh, we have a, a prog progress to, to do so, but I think it's uh, just to start, it, it's, it's good to know exactly where we are uh, in each buildings. So I hope I answer. <laughs> it's just the yes. beginning. No, it, it's <laughs> totally clear. So we will wait and see, and then uh, maybe this uh, kind of advisory body will be installed later. 
And a, a second question, which might be sound a little bit very German, but Vichy is not only famous because of the, um, of the spa town and because of the famous uh, mineral water, but also because of its role in World War II. And in the preparing uh, weeks, I received a letter from the French Ministry of Culture, which was announcing a new publication, which is called Ar Architecture et Urbanisme sous la France de Vichy. And why is it noteworthy? It's noteworthy because they sent me the information under the label of dark heritage, of dissonant heritage, of totalitarian heritage uh, in undemocratic times. And so my question is, of course, do we include, should we include, and also consider ambivalent or controversially discussed heritage layers in the discussion on world heritage nominations? Uh, or also included in a kind of marketing strategy and communication strategy of world heritage sites. How do you deal with this, uh, with this fact? Well, uh, I'm not aware of this, uh, of this book, but um, for, for instance, as you, you know, the nomination dossier of the Great Spa, uh, the, time, the time frame doesn't go to this, uh, this period of uh, 19, 1940. But locally, uh, when we are talking about this subject, for, for I'm going to give you an example. Uh, last year, in 2019, we made, for the first time of the story, a big uh, exhibition uh, on the 2,000 years of history of Vichy, like a spa town. And we show this period because this period of between uh, 1940 and 44, you can explain many things if you have a large perspective of the spa town. You can say that these governments came to Vichy because we had 200 hotels. We have a, a central a telephonic, very sophisticated because it was uh, a spa, a European spa town. So you can, so we don't have in Vichy any problem to talk about this period, but if you replace it in the large history of the spa town. But yes, this nomination, let, let's, let's be clear. Uh, if we are nominated uh, one day, I really hope so, it will be, so the main impact for me, uh, it will be an impact on the image of the city. It will maybe not force, it will help people to understand really scientifically the real story of the city. And there's no, no problem with this period. Everything is expectable. But yeah, you're right. Many people come to Vichy as a tourist to see where was this famous government. Yeah, some, sometimes more interested to see where was uh, the office of the Maréchal Pétain. That more to, to understand. So, but we have to explain everything together and not split uh, okay. things. Thank you very much, uh, Mati, for your presentation and also for discussing. Uh, and we will continue the discussion uh, when we have heard and listened to all the speakers. Now, I would like to introduce Lucy Sokhokova from uh, Carlo Vari. She is there. Uh, she's representing the, the Office of Architecture and Planning of the city. And she is also UNESCO World Heritage Site Manager in SPE uh, or designated World Heritage Site Manager, uh, and she will talk about the challenges of managing thermal architecture in Carlo Vivari. It's up to you, uh, Lucy. Lucy, we don't hear you. Can you turn on your microphone, please? Lucy. Lucy. <laughs> she has her microphone on now, I think. Yeah? OK. But oh, we, we don't hear you. Hmm. I can't hear No. Yes, I can't hear you. No. Can you test your, maybe you t take off your earphones? 
Maybe it's something connected to your earphones. Oh, now it's off. Just try again, your microphone on. Mm -mm. Can we call her? Can uh, we unplug you, unplug and go back? Jens, I'm just asking our technician. He can, he can do anything, yeah. yeah. Lucy, maybe you can un unplug your earphones again. Just completely unplug your earphones and then try to talk like this. No. Just unplug them from, from the computer. Ah, OK. OK. Um, so she can hear us, but we cannot hear her. No. Um, maybe. And now? Yes. Now. Yes. There you are. Yes. Right. Hello. I'm sorry for that. So, again, thank you for the words, and uh, I'm really glad that I can be a part of this event, even if it's not possible to meet you personally. And uh, I will talk about the challenges of the thermal architecture, and I want to focus on the challenges of the heritage conservation. And if you can have uh, another slide, please. I will start with the question, what people imagine when they hear the name Carlo Vivari? Uh, the history brought to typical products, images or names, which all together make an identity of a city. And in this case, it's a green city. The typical products as Becherovka is, or the spa waffles, colonnades, architecture, the spa cups, and the springs. And all these, are having a long tradition and make themselves an original unique for Carlo Vivari. The next slide, please. The origin of Carlo Vivari dates back to around 1350, and the cities have been developed for centuries. Each period has brought a specific contribution and its historical value is definitely unquestionable. In the picture, you can see the development of Carlo Vivari which started to grow mainly in the valley of the river Tepla. During the second half of the 19th century, and especially after the annexation to the European Railway Network in 1870, Carlevary enjoyed its greatest economic boom. And we can say that it was a golden age of the Carlevary, and they have started to grow out of the valley of river Tepla. Since 1993, the historical center of the city has been declared as an urban heritage zone. And nowadays it's an urban heritage reservation and this part is under the strict protection. We can see that there is not so much space for a new building, although because of the steep terrain around the valley, but that brings us an opportunity for revitalization of old objects in the city or for the re revitalization of brownfields. The next slide, please. For the next positive development and formation of future perspective of the city, the strategic concept and the dialogue between the politicians, professional public and the local inhabitants is very necessary. I would like to mention two actual strategic documents we are working on. And one of them is the new strategic plan of the city of Karlovy Vary. And I mention it because I see the big change in the process, how the city is working on it against the previous strategy. And that, mean, uh, that means the common approach, many workshops with the professional public or panel discussion uh, called the World 2040 against the strict view of the few professionals. The next important document are the strategy of a public spaces and the manual of public spaces. Because one of the important principles of working with public space is to return the content and the meaning to the spa tradition, specific urban structure and architecture, and to sensitively supplement them with a new impact. 
These documents give us a good and bad examples of use and uh, it's primarily intended for the needs of the employees of Calvary Valley Municipality and for the Bureau of the Architecture. The next slide, please. The public spaces are important as a connection between the architectural objects. It's important how people feel in the cities. And therefore, the content of these documents is also related to the actual topics as uh, the transport in the city, uh, which we want to go down, especially if the quarter forecourse. And the next is the sensitive care about the landscape and the viewpoints or the proper commercial in the city, which is really challenging task. The next slide, please. And what is the real next challenge uh, is to find the proper content and the program of the building. In the picture, you can see an object of uh, the Imperial Spa, which used to be a representative spa facility with the most modern operation in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. And currently, the building uh, is unused for its original purpose. And the subject of negotiations between the Karlovy region, the city, and the professional public is to find a suitable functional use of the building. Uh, which we can see on the next slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, and architecture is not only the building itself, but the place which can affect the emotions or mind of the people. We can reach to this stage by a proper content and activities inside. And what we want is to keep the architecture alive. The idea is to transform the representative spa with the aim of the intended reconversion of the building for public cultural purposes, specifically uh, the multifunctional hall. And this idea is also related to the Carlo Vivari Symphonic Orchestra, which has always played a big and important role in the spa town. The aim is to have a representative hall connected to the traditional place where we can feel the genius latte. Next slide. So, of course, that we can't forget about the tradition and respect the heritage, but the proper way is to find a working compromise between conservative ways and the new options. So, uh, which identity of the city we want? We don't want to be seen only as a city of a typical product, but also as a prosperous, friendly, cultural, and connected city. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucia Sohokova, for this uh, insight uh, in the situation of Carlo Vivari, and also for the insight in the theater of Carlo Vivari. As far as I know, it's uh, an architectural building of uh, Fellner and Tellner, who were uh, well-known uh, architects of theater, uh, which will be now modified or altered for new use. Um, you, you underlined the, the dialogue between the, the city administration or between official experts and the, the, the public uh, citizens and stakeholders, uh, especially when we discuss the valorization of public space and of green space. I think it's very interesting that in both cases, in Vichy, in the Western Europe, as well as in Central or Eastern Europe, in Carlo Vivari, the public space and the question of traffic has become a very important uh, issue for how to deal with it. And my question is, how or who is supporting your uh, initiative and your strategic planning to improve the quality of public space? And is there a difference between private owners or proprietors and public or municipal owners and uh, between owners and tenants, for example, who is the public which is involved in the whole process? Now uh, we are in the stage that uh, we are uh, making this uh, document. Uh, so we will apply uh, these uh, inputs in the future, but uh, it's, uh, it's 
general topic uh, it's also for both of both of the groups but mainly uh, because also the people living in in the city and moving in the city are creating the city so that's the reason i think for the it uh, it's for both of the groups for the people who are creating the physical place and then for the people who are living there in the moment in the moment and do you also try to include guests and visitors in this dialogue and in this communication because they some of them may feel that this spa resort is already their home where they live or where they feel at home even if they come from somewhere else uh, not directly in in the daily dialogue uh, during the creating of the document but in the future i think they can uh, feel it and see it also uh, through the art in in, in the city and uh, to react on on, on it uh, like uh, the response after they visit okay so thank you very much. Um, may I go now to the hosting city and to Lisa Pöchki, who is already waiting, as I can see, for us and for her presentation. Uh, she is the head of the Department for World Heritage Nomination in Baden-Baden, as well as for urban design and urban planning. And she will present now the hosting city Baden-Baden and the development of this spa town. Uh, Ms. Hirschke, you are already. I... The challenges on managing thermal architecture and its context in Baden Baden. Baden Baden's roots reach back to Roman times. In the so called long 19th century, the city experienced its golden age a European spa town with a characteristic urban layout and distinctive cityscape is emerging. Already in the second half of the 20th century, the special features of the city were recognized and active efforts were made to protect them. Therefore, the long-term appreciation of the historical heritage is basis for our daily work. Since 2006, the efforts to become World Heritage have led to a deeper engagement with cultural heritage and a systematization of the informal and legal instruments for its protection. This includes strengthening public awareness of the architectural and cultural heritage. The positioning of the preparatory World Heritage Management within the city administration allows already now a close integration into all topics of urban development and monumental protection on a local level and a close connection with the State Office for Cultural Heritage Baden-Württemberg. Thermal heritage is more than protection and conservation of thermal architecture. In fact, our challenges? Sustainable high-quality urban development Compatibility and integration of modern architecture into the city's shape of its historic town, into our genius Lotzi. Restoration of buildings, streets and squares in accordance with preservation requirements. Understanding and communication values. Some background information. The thermal heritage in Baden-Baden concentrates on the city center with its historic character and urban differentiation into Old Spa Quarter, New Spa District, Villa Areas, Closed City Expansions, Parks and Gardens, and all being embedded into a hilly surrounding spa landscape. Within the nominated World Heritage Site, you find the typical thermal architectures like Cure House, Casino, Arcades of Shops, Pump Room, Theatre, Bathing and Treatment Facilities, Characteristic Sacral Buildings, Hotels, Villas, and so on. The entire property is protected by statute as an ensemble in accordance with the Monument Protection, Area, Protection Act Baden-Württemberg. Any alteration to the protected appearance is subject to approval. More than 1,000 buildings are under monumental protection in Baden-Baden, of which 770 buildings are listed in the design property. 
I will show now four examples. Example one. In the villa areas, different older planning instruments exist for the structural development, like preservation statutes, numerous legally binding land use plans, which are up to 40 years old, as well as build-up areas. However, a historic urban quarter consists not only of buildings, but also of gardens, enclosures and street spaces. It can have a special value for urban planning, historical or artistic reasons. For the purpose of an in-depth assessment and elaboration of these values, Baden-Baden will support, with the support of the State Office for Cultural Heritage, has drawn up value-based urban conservation plans for the historic villa areas, including the villa gardens and public realm. The cultural monuments are shown in red and their gardens or garden monuments in dark green. The buildings, worthy of preservation, are shown in orange, according green spaces in light green. On this basis, the monument list was updated in 2017. In the historic villa areas, there are increasingly modern buildings which do not harmonize with the traditional architectural language and have problems with the integration into the historical context. In the next step of qualifying the villa areas, we commissioned a careful and very detailed survey on the strengths and weaknesses. Based on this survey, we developed an, anal an analysis and finally a design guide for new building additions, so-called Baufibel. At present, legally binding design statutes are being drawn up. Example 2. The Reinhard Fieser Bridge is an important link in the historic urban development between the old spa town with the bathing quarter and the new spa district from the 19th century. In the course of the restoration of the listed bridge, an expert analysis on the historical urban development of this bridge square in the heart of the spa town was commissioned to provide information for the future plaza design. This project was also worked out in close cooperation with the State Office for Cultural Heritage. The comparison of the two plans show clearly visible the upgrading of the new space. The listed bridgeheads by Max Leuger will be restored and will be vacated from disturbing fixtures and superfluous furniture, so that the function of the bridge and this important connection become visible again. The historical axiality is emphasized. The public space will be returned to the flaneurs in the heart of the nominated World Heritage Site. Example 3. The Karlsruhe Institute of Technology created a room book for the pump room with its colonnades and fountain hall. In addition to the pure docu documentation purpose, the room book serves as a basis for an evaluation in terms of monument conservation. The room book is an indispensable method for the systematic recognition of the existing buildings in the field of monument preservation. On the left you can see the scaffolded pump room during the restoration of the facade. Example 4. On this slide you can see some examples of our public relations activities for thermal heritage and thermal architecture. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if you are still available to add uh, a question. Lisa Pöchki, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You can, can hear me. me. Can uh, I, I can't. Turn on your camera again, sorry. Lisa, your yeah. camera is still yeah, yeah, off. We are trying. Just a second. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Comes to the hint. In in this this round table, we are discussing issues under the under the headline managing thermal architecture and generating community support. Um, and you emphasize the urban context, which is maybe 
more important or is which is beyond the certain buildings and individual structures for managing complex world heritage uh, applicants and but compared for example to Carlo Vivari which which has a very changeful history and radical changes and transformations in the 20th century Ban Ban seems for me like a fortress of uh, continuity and stability and even the dialect has not changed in the last <laughs> uh, 100 or 200 years. So what, is there a specific mentality in Baden-Baden or, or is there a specific urban society, which a local community, which has a specific consciousness of the tradition and of the significance of tradition? And is this an advantage for the Department of Urban Design or is it a disadvantage? How can you what can you say about the local spirit in Baden-Baden in on this issue and on the World Heritage nomination? Um, good morning to everybody. Yes, I'd like to answer these, this question. I think uh, in Baden-Baden, uh, there is a special awareness of um, living in a very special city with a long history. And that means that it's not only the, um, um, the public awareness or the people living here in Baden-Baden who are um, aware of this uh, tradition and history, but it's also the international guests coming to Baden-Baden. And this mix, mixture, um, I think it, it, it feels to any feeling or it leads to any feeling that um, this special place needs also special um, 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 aufmerksamkeit. Attention, attention concerning um, concerning the, for example, the cityscape or the shape of um, and the um, the outer appearance of the city. Um, we have a lot of groups working very actively and engaged in saving and protecting um, the city qualities, like the high quality of the green areas of the parks and gardens, or other groups who are working on. Um, on the cityscape, uh, we have uh, um, um, associations who are working with us on qualifying, for example, the villa areas or other groups who are uh, supporting us in um, giving a lot of interpretation material to the, to the public um, about the history. So I think um, we have um, a lot of interested and engaged people supporting us on the one hand side, supporting us in positive as in a posi positive as ex aspect, as well as in a very critical as um, aspect, because people coming to Baden Baden to be new residents, and we have a lot of them here, uh, living in very um, expensive areas in the city, they demand, they dem demand quality, they demand um, uh, uh, quietness, they demand perfect um, organized um, traffic, perfect organized, also public traffic, public organized and cleaned streets and gardens and parks. So I think it's a mixture of support and critic, but critic is not bad because critic leads us to new opportunities. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And may I add a, a second question because some of the previous speakers, they mentioned that Baden-Baden is somewhat like the, the, the capital of German spa movement or of the German nomination, but there are about 30 or 40 spa and thermal locations and destinations in Baden-Württemberg. And so my question is, what will they benefit or will they have any profit from the labeling of Baden-Baden as a World Heritage Site? Is it supporting them and their interests as well, or is it only a unique uh, selling position uh, with advantage for Baden-Baden and without any uh, influence or any support for other uh, locations in, in this whole region? Because I think it's the, the region is very interesting, not only Baden-Baden. Yes, that's true, sure. <laughs> but, um, but I'm convinced, and we also know, about, know a lot about it, um, that um, all the other um, Baden-Württemberg spa towns are interested and they are following uh, the process of, of the World Heritage nomination because it's the same not only in Baden-Württemberg, but I think it's European-wide that, that the spa cities um, will get more attention um, worldwide uh, concerning the qualities of spa towns, of historic spa towns who have 
um, um, who, who are able to show until today what thermal heritage is and what the quality of thermal spa, of spa towns are. So I think, um, no, they, they, um, they, they accompany our process, they are interested in it, and they hope to get also prof or to take profit from, uh, from this nomination. And do, do you think that it will be possible not only to create a European network on spa towns, but also a regional network, including smaller spa towns or thermal towns like in Baden-Württemberg? Is there also a network on, on a regional level which could be supported or which could be uh, promoted by a World Heritage nomination? Not yet. I think it's a good idea to do things like this because I think uh, networks on the same theme are very uh, um, important and they may be very successful for future and for uh, for uh, sharing uh, best practice or so. So I think uh, we will work on this and not only on Baden-Württemberg basis as well because I think this could be a good blueprint for um, for for other um, spa towns in Europe as well. Uh, in fact, in in France or in Italy or so as well, or in Czech Republic, there are many many um, spa towns who are in a geographical um, close um, near. Yes. Hmm? Okay, th thank, thank you very much. Uh, and we will continue the discussion uh, later. Now I, I will introduce Hans-Peter Mengele, who can be called the, the father of the World Heritage nomination of Baden-Baden, uh, somewhat like the elder statesman of the whole initiative, which started, I think, 10 or 15 years ago in Baden-Baden with a very small part of the city, the so-called Lichtenthaler Allee, and now it has become a multinational nomination for World Heritage Sites. Welcome to you, Hans-Peter Mengele. It's, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Hasper, for having me in this uh, great uh, conference. I enjoy it so much, learning so much, and um, I'm happy that we can have it virtually. Uh, well, it would be a big loss if we would have, if we, would have missed this great opportunity, but hopefully having you all in Baden-Baden next time, physically. Okay. Well, um, maybe maybe I'm, I, I share a little story with you. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, um, we, see, um, we see that I'm speaking for the civic uh, engagement stakeholders. And uh, Simone just jumped to the next slide where we see the part, uh, a beautiful uh, villa from uh, the 19th century. Actually, this is the place where all began. Um, the <clears throat> this is the birthplace for, um, for the great spas of Europe uh, um, uh, initiative and application. Um, uh, what happened? Um, well, um, Today, this is um, um, the number one conference center for German business community top management. And um, uh, one day, about 20 years ago, I, I was curious learning uh, why the gentleman who was a businessman from uh, Hamburg spent so much money uh, and it was very hard for him to find the place to build this uh, villa, uh, to be present in Baden-Baden with such a building. And uh, doing a lot of research, uh, I have learned step by step um, what a city, what a spa town really was about uh, in the 19th century. And step by step, all the functions and all the backgrounds and um, all the components of a magnificent city uh, appeared and ended up in my book that I published um, uh, in 09 uh, about the history of this building. And a group of citizens, as a group of citizens, we were a small group and, and some of them very enthusiastic about the, the park, the, the beautiful Lichtenthal Allee with which already had its uh, 350 years anniversary of, 
hard to believe for me at that time, already 350 years that you can really say this state park is that old. So um, in this building, the idea came up, we had a meeting there. There should be more than just having all these beautiful um, um, buildings, uh, which uh, Paul so nicely put in categories uh, and uh, the function and, and, and even more how people are there living um, and interacting uh, as, as a society uh, with all aspects of the society. Uh, visitors, guests, professionals, politicians, diplomats, and so on and so on. So what we all learned over the years. So there should be more and doesn't have a quality for uh, becoming inscripted as a World Heritage Site. Yes, we said, okay, let's try. So we started and we knew this would be a, a very hard and long way to go, but why not? It's so much substance there, just let's begin. So the next uh, slide, please. Um, and uh, this was then the first most initial meeting that we hold in 06 as the first symposium, Freundeskreis Lichtenthaler Allee, that's our association. Uh, and we were really those who um, hosted this meeting because uh, that was the first step of learning more and finding out um, is, there, is there maybe indeed a chance um, um, to, to end up as a World Heritage Site, you know, 06, a uh, long, long time ago. But um, uh, one, one important point was that we got, uh, we had um, uh, great inputs. Let's say we had uh, great advice, uh, very important uh, by Frau Dr. Ringbeck. Uh, and uh, we had uh, support from experts, uh, Dr. Förderer. Um, so that we really, from the very beginning, had an eye on the European, European landscape. Yeah, that's what we learned very early. Um, if, if there should be a chance, it's only in the European context. And um, on the next slide, we will see um, that um, um, in this process, uh, 2010, uh, this was the first very important international conference and uh, uh, with that, we, we could really keep uh, the momentum going. I think that was uh, for us as representatives of citizens and civic society, it was most important that we not just uh, having the idea and starting with the process, but also uh, having the process going on and keeping the momentum alive. And uh, therefore this was very important and more and more stakeholders um, um, more and more stakeholders were really bringing themselves behind this um, idea and um, just let me shorten it. You know all where it ended up. It's a marvelous European group of 11. Uh, it, we have great political support. We all, um, I think you all and your um, municipalities with your local governments, with your state governments, with national governments, and uh, with a great uh, community of experts uh, like you, Mr. Husband, let me say that, let me mention that, and many others who are really uh, now today are those who are carrying this uh, idea, this uh, idea that was born in the Palais beyond forward. We had the next conference, uh, if, if you might, uh, Simone, the next uh, slide is also about the second big conference um, and uh, you, you heard uh, our experts from the Landesbank Malam and, 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 and all the others. This is really, uh, for me, it's amazing to see how, how, what a huge expertise really uh, became brought up yeah, over, over 15 years. It's a huge, huge uh, uh, impact. And therefore I'm enthusiastic seeing today um, uh, how representatives um, from, um, from our uh, partner cities, yeah, like Anke in Vichy and, and the others are really um, uh, adding so much value, adding so much value to this, you know, and therefore 
uh, I really hope that we will end up successfully with UNESCO and um, with so much um, research being done mm. and more and more experience uh, being put together. I, I sincerely hope that we will be successful. Yes. Thank, thank you very much for the presentation and also thank you very much for reminding us that there a lot of knowledge has been brought up during the whole process on an international level. Maybe what we did not expect when we started in 2006 with the whole project. It is a fantastic uh, um, uh, science uh, which has been brought up uh, today and also the categories which were uh, introduced today are very interesting to understand this phenomena of uh, thermal uh, heritage. We, maybe we will come later and of course we will uh, follow uh, uh, your invitation to come to uh, Baden Baden next year after the pandemic and when you will host us. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. And now I would like to go over to uh, Bath, which is the only World Heritage site which is already uh, inscribed in the World Heritage List since years, not only because of the bath, but also because of the uh, archeological and classicist um, architecture in this time. And I would like to uh, introduce Anna Baker. She is the project director of the Cleveland Pool Trust, which is a nonprofit, let's call it a kind of charity organization to redevelop a very significant element of the World Heritage City of Bath. Anna Baker, the, uh, the floor is yours. I can't see you, but I hope you are with us. I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, okay, oh, thank, thank you. you. Everything's fine. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm here to speak, um, yeah, about the Cleveland Pools project. It's a much smaller scale than uh, the presentations you've heard today. Um, but a really important part of the story of water in the city of Bath. Um, can I have the next slide, Simone? So this is our, our miniature crescent. Um, it's tiny, as I'll show you, compared to some other parts of Bath, um, but a really, a really important part um, of the overall story of how Bath fits together as a city um, of such importance in terms of thermal architecture. Um, but it's probably important to tell you, before I go into the detail of the pools themselves, a bit of the context of the city that this sits in. Um, so before we kind of get into the detail, if we can go on to the next slide, we'll just talk a bit about Bath as a city. Um, so as you know, Bath is a World Heritage Site, has been since 1987. Um, a city founded on water, you know, originally developed by the Romans uh, and then laterally by the Georgians. And it's the Georgian style, I think, that Bath is known for as a city overall. Um, the Georgians were very good at developing, I suppose, all of these levels that Paul's talked about earlier in terms of thermal architecture. So not only focusing on the buildings that are about the spa function themselves, but then the supporting all the other elements that you need to support the visitors to come to a city like Bath to take the waters. So we have hotels, um, promenades, as others have spoken about, and also a connection with the landscape. I think that's where our pools, where it's not a thermal pool, um, it's cold water. They are connected to thermal architecture, both by being a place of water and also having a very strong connection to the landscape and a feeling of nature. Can I have the next slide, please? So our pools are on the left. Um, it's a mini, mini crescent compared to on the right, the Royal Crescent in Bath, which is a very a famous showpiece. Uh, so the Cleveland pools themselves, they don't have the kind of architectural detailing that the typical Georgian um, architecture in, this, in the center of the city does, but they're a very modest, simple building, um, functional, more functional. And as you can see, it's a small crescent with six uh, changing rooms either side and a, an entranceway, a central arch entranceway, and then some small caretakers uh, accommodation above. And all of this is focused towards the pool that you can see at the bottom of this image, um, which are the Cleveland pools. Um, and that's, that's what our project is based around. Can I have the next slide? 
Um, so the pools were built in 1815. They are the oldest uh, surviving um, public outdoor swimming pool in the UK, if not in Western Europe. And we are fairly confident that they were developed by an architect called John Pinch the Elder. He in Bath was the architect that you, you went to if you had a site that was steeply sloping or to do with water or flooding. And it makes sense that he was involved in this project because unfortunately for me in the modern day construction of this, we have all of those things to deal with still. Um, but as you can see from these images, this, the Cleveland Pools has been popular ever since 1815, really, since it opened. We have a lot of um, information on its use and its popularity through the ages. So we've got here an image from the Victorian period and then in the 1960s. Um, and it was open and popular for use until the mid 1980s. At that point, unfortunately for us, fashions just changed in Bath and the local leisure centre was where people wanted to go. They wanted to swim somewhere covered and somewhere warmer. So the fashion moved away and the site was closed, although it did have one season where somebody tried to turn it into a fish farm instead, but that didn't last for very long. Um, can I have the next slide, Simone? Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about why the Cleveland Pools was built in the first place. Um, and really it's the connection to water, but the natural connection to the river um, that drove our development. Um, I can see some amused faces already. Um, this was partly driven um, through nude swimming. <laughs> um, in the Georgian period, I think popularity of cold water bathing as a complementary thing to bathing in thermal waters was growing. Um, people knew that there were benefits maybe for circulation, for treatment of arthritis, etc. Um, but there wasn't anywhere to do it. So people were coming and swimming in this section of the river in Bath. Um, unfortunately, um, for the sensibilities of the Georgian women at the time, um, they were doing it naked. Uh, there were also a few drownings in the river. So there was a, a movement to try and create somewhere more private uh, and safer where people could bathe in the cold water. Um, but this was all happening just after the Napoleonic Wars. So in Bath, there wasn't the money available that there, there had been previously for the Georgian development of the city. So this was a much more community rooted project. Um, effectively, it was crowdfunded. Um, so it was funded by a subscription, so private subscription, but for public good of the people of Bath. And we have the list of original subscribers and they're very much the, the normal man. So we have people like accountants, watchmakers, publishers, etc., rather than, you know, the wealthy families of Bath. Um, and this quote here is from the original advert for subscribers. And it talks about providing somewhere with a connection to the river um, for those who swim, but also those who do not swim um, to be accommodated and have somewhere to enjoy. And I think for me, this is this is the really important thing about how we sit in a relationship with thermal architecture. It doesn't always have to be about water. There are these supporting aspects that people can enjoy this connection with nature. Um, being outdoors is, is important too. And this was clearly what we were trying to create here. Uh, if we can come on to the next slide. So these are some images of what we're hoping to um, to build on in the next couple of years. So the plan that I'm working on at the moment is to bring the pools back into, into modern use. So it's a, it's a relatively light touch development, we hope, because the buildings that we have are grade two star listed. And to be honest, they're great. <laughs> um, we are doing minor repairs on the buildings themselves and some bringing the pool up to a modern standard and breaking it into two so that we have a a main pool and the children's pool. Um, the really nice thing is that if people are continuing their, their journey of water through the city, they will actually be able to arrive at the pools by water as well. We'll have a pontoon on the river adjacent so that that relationship with the river is, is developed as well. Uh, the next slide. Um, I was asked to think about what one of the biggest challenges that we faced is on the project. And I think for me, it's about community engagement. So um, everyone here knows Bath's a World Heritage City, and there is an engagement with heritage from a large proportion of you know, the community locally. 
but actually there's a significant proportion of people who aren't involved or don't really get it. Um, and I think the big question that we often find is people saying, well, why is this type of project relevant to me? You know, we have enthusiasts, heritage enthusiasts, as you can see, um, but we also have plenty of other sections of the community who we really need to work with to engage. So that's a big part of our project and something that I find really exciting because we have young people who will be the future and we will be using this in future generations, but we also have older people and we have the, the benefit that this, this site has been open until relatively recently. So we have some stories, stories that we can sh share between generations. There are lots of people who learned to swim at the pools, uh, had you know their first kiss on the banks of the river, et cetera. So there are nice ways that we can engage people and show them that this is a place that they can, they can use. It's not a museum. There's a, a living heritage here. Uh, the next slide, please. So just some final thoughts for me um, in terms of the impact of COVID on us. So it's impacted us in terms of the city of Bath greatly. We've really seen a drop in numbers, but I think that we will benefit from being somewhere with more open space and more connection to nature in a general sense. And hopefully the pools will also do the same. Um, I think people are trying to start moving away from the more crowded cityscapes and somewhere where a pace of life can be a bit slower and also explore the, the locality in more detail. So my hope is that in rejuvenating this site for use, we can actually almost do kind of come full circle with the Georgian um, expectation or aim and ensure that we have this connection with nature, connection with water and that it's, it's good for people and it brings benefit to the city of Bath and people beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ms. Baker in, in Bath for this uh, project, which is a, a small project, but uh, I think it's a very uh, fascinating project because of its connection of architecture and built heritage with water, not hot water, not springs, but with water, nature and the community involvement so i think it's a it's a, a good it can play a, a model role for the whole issue how to find an integration an integrate solution thank you very much i have a, a question when you when you discussed it you, you mentioned that it is not ornamented it is not decorated it is from a stylistic point of view it's not so important or not so fascinating but is there because of the world heritage status of bath is there, uh, how are the, the requirements on authenticity and integrity? And how did you discuss this issue that you fill and meet the criteria of the World Heritage Inscription? So the requirements of the site, so it's um, a solicited site in itself while also being part of the World Heritage Site. So it's a grade two star listed building. So in terms of the, the redevelopment there, we have to be, we have very strict rules in terms of how much repair or not we can do. And it's, okay. it's very much try to maintain the original intent with sympathetic repair rather than adding, adding any ornament. Um, I hope that answers the, the question. <laughs> Okay, and, uh, and a second question in the in the starting presentations in the round table, the question of, of traffic of transport uh, has been always uh, underlined. How do people get there and how is, for example, the car problem or a parking problem and, and things like like this? Is there a problem or is it well connected to public transport? Um, there is a problem, <laughs> definitely, for us. Um, it's really poorly connected by car, but I think that that might work in our favour overall um, because we are trying to promote the story that this is this is a part of your well-being visit, so that you don't just come to the pools to swim, but you come on a on a day and you walk okay. or you cycle or you take a trip on the river, so that it's more it's more a part of something bigger for people. And we're well connected in terms of foot and cycle transport because we have the river on one side of the site, and quite nearby we have the canal. 
So we have great walkways, um, which I hope we can use to, to some benefit and encourage people to walk and cycle as much as possible. Okay, so you can go there by, by bicycle, you can walk and you can swim uh, if, if you want. And it is a, it's a, a wellness uh, walk uh, you can have in a, uh, before and uh, uh, later for, for this heritage site. So now I, I think we can, we'll stop. Thank you very much for the presentations and we can introduce and start the, the round table and maybe we can start again with the question of the challenges and opportunities of managing uh, thermal architecture on the building level and both on the building level, but also on the urban level, because I think it's not only important of the on the building level, on the built architectural heritage, but it is always this question, how to deal with open space, how to deal with the, the distance between the, the buildings and with the skylines um, and so on. And uh, the presentation of Andreas Förderer was interesting for me because he underlined that the content uh, of thermal architecture has never changed. It is only uh, the use, the context, also the stylistic uh, styles. And from a world heritage point of view, uh, I have to admit that this question is very important because what is the, the, the idea of the world heritage nomination and of world heritage protection is to protect and to preserve um, the, the architecture and, um, and the histor historical legacy. So my question is, uh, what, is the, what is the relevance? What is the priority of architecture for the world heritage managers? Maybe we can start with uh, Anke Matisse uh, with the example from, uh, from France and from Vichy. Well, um, I'm not sure if I don't get the question right, but uh, you said uh, managing is also, thermal architecture is also managing the uses uh, inside. And I have to admit that um, for the World Heritage nomination, we have uh, to prove that uh, this tradition of um, SPA uh, is, still, is still alive. So we, we need to keep this uh, alive, but sometimes it's alive in new buildings and you also have to uh, find new uses um, for the, in these historic buildings. So, um, for, for instance, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take uh, also the example of uh, hotels, these, uh, these big hotels, uh, yes. which is part, part of the thermal architecture. In the case of Vichy, all these big hotels uh, are closed, were, were closed in, in the 70s and now are, uh, are apartments. So um, I don't know if well, maybe can you repeat your question because I'm not sure to get exactly the point where you you, you want to go. Um, I my my question is from uh, from the um, perspective from the point of view of managing a heritage site. Is the question is the architecture is the history is the historical legacy is it of importance for the redevelopment and for future. Uh, for, for future uses and functions, uh, for example, in the World Heritage Site. And what is, is it, may, maybe is there a contribution, for example, for health treatment? Is there a contribution for wellness, for feeling good in these cities, which comes and which derives from architecture and from the history and from the historic legacy? Or is it, is it only, let's say, a ki kind of decorated container for contemporary use and contemporary life? Okay, no, no, you, you, you still have all what makes a, a spa town uh, in, in the core, uh, in, in, the, in the spa quarter, in historic buildings. But what you raise, it's uh, we have um, building, historic buildings, they, they lost their function, and now we have to find another function. And with this uh, well heritage nomination, we have uh, this qualit um, qualitative uh, pressure to see where, uh, how far we can go 
uh, in these uh, changes of views, is there some places where we are talk about the former uh, first class spa? Uh, spa? We cannot today uh, create a spa in, in this building. So yeah. if we want to keep this spirit uh, there, we have to find um, a new function. I mean, it, there's no uh, challenge in terms of protection. It is a historical monument. We have regulation things. So there's no, um, we are not worried about losing authenticity uh, in terms of uh, architecture. It's more authenticity in terms of um, uses, uh, experience. It's more my, um, I think it's more so the main challenge um, of this. I, I'm not worried um, about creating new big modern project in, in, in the uh -huh. core. It's much more inside the walls uh, what we, we have to, to do. And do you think, or maybe uh, Lucy Sokhova from uh, Carlo Vivari, do you think that the uh, that architecture and decoration and stylistic features of architecture, are they contributing to, to people who live there? Is it, is it of interest uh, for them? And how do you think about how can you preserve it and redevelop it and revitalize this kind of, of, of quality? Or is it not of importance for the management uh, of, a, of a thermal um, destination as uh, Carlo Vivari? I think it is important to, to keep this style for uh, feeling the ghost of, of the history, but uh, then for sure to find this balance and the con to develop the content of the building in more modern way. But uh, these historical features are important for sure. Yes, I, I think that maybe the uh, authenticity is defined not only by the authenticity of architecture and of uh, materials uh, and of fabrics or of decoration, but also by the use, by the function and by the spirit. And I think it's, it's always necessary to, to think about continuity also of, of the spirit and of the functions and not only of architecture, so that this heritage sites are attractive for people to be used and to be visited uh, also in the next generation under changing uh, conditions, for example. So maybe uh, Lisa Pechke, what is from your point of view, you mentioned that you have also redevelopment projects in Baden-Baden. How, how is the relationship between the historic fabric and contemporary or future uses and needs? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think um, I think you have to to discuss it differently, because I think coming to a spa town, to a historic spa town, people are waiting for or expecting um, an historic ambiente, huh? and not only as a picture, but on, also as uh, showing the historic use in um, in current times. That means we try on the one hand side we try to show. Um, living traditions. That means um, our main important buildings, spa buildings, are the Friedrichsbad, for example. And it's possible that you are yeah, that you take a swim without a swim um, shirt, maybe yes. suits, swimsuits. Um, so, 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 so you can use the historic rooms and and um, and have the historic treatment of um, swimming and spa of um, Irish Roman spa tradition. And the other example of spa architecture with is there, but also with, with the transport, its historic function is the casino. The casino Baden-Baden, you can earn money, um, not earn money, but you, you can, can play, you can game, you can use several games in the historic rooms. So that's living spa tradition. And so that the buildings are not only, it's not only theater, it's not only a facade, but it's living. Um, and you can transport the idea of what is a, a spa town and, and a society spa where it's, um, um, 
which has a lot of different function and shows a lot of different function and qualities. And the other side is that you have the, um, the buildings, hotels, um, villas, uh, whatever, um, and they want to develop into a future, into a new design, into a new function, and you have to to care for this. What does it mean? And so you have on the one hand side, the heritage protection would give us the rules in which kind and which way it may be developed concerning the outer appearance. And on the other hand side, you have the new buildings which have to be included into the historic urban settlement. And there you have to find the rules and the ways and the methods and the tools to integrate this in this historic surrounding. So I think that are the two points of view we have to work on okay. and to work thank, with. Thank, thank you very much. And also for mentioning this term of living tradition or of living heritage, which is very important, I think, from the point of developing a world heritage city, which is more than a piece of art uh, in, in the heritage sense. I, I saw there are some, uh, some speakers who wanted to add or to question something. Maybe Simone, you can take over yes. who it was. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have had um, hands from um, Hans-Peter as a panelist uh, of this round table, but also from Paul Simons. So, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't. I was not sure who was first. Um, maybe Hans Peter or Paul. No, Hans Peter was first. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Simone, uh, Simone, if you don't mind to bring up my last slide. Uh, okay, York is listening. The slide. Yeah. Which one you would like to have? The very last one with the dream color, because I think. Uh, this is such an important uh, issue that um, Mr. Haspel brought up. Um, what, what happens um, with, the, with the architecture? Uh, this gives a nice example. Our, our uh, association of uh, Lichten, Friends of Lichtenthaler Allee, uh, World Heritage Initiative, um, took the opportunity to bring in a nice exhibition into the Trinkhalle. Uh, Trinkhalle is one of the landmark buildings right in the center of the spa district, uh, right, right across uh, the main building um, of uh, the Konversationshaus and Casino. And uh, we took that, this opportunity to, to how to initiate a, and finance also privately financed a nice exhibition about our uh, joint application. Yeah. And we are uh, pointing out all members of the group of 11, uh, since we didn't want to have this just for Baden-Baden, but also for visitors in Baden-Baden and citizens of Baden-Baden to learn more from our partners in Europe. And um, this is very well received and uh, gives an idea you know, how we can bring in new life with the great spas of Europe into such an important building. Uh, before this exhibition, this was, was rather empty and uh, wasn't it very usefully used and presented to public. So people were just coming and, and, and watching the facade and the architecture, but now they get an, an, an idea uh, what's, what's going on with the great, with the great um, spas um, of Europe. And um, this gives an idea how important it will be for the management uh, to introduce uh, private initiatives and also the private uh, business community, also financially, you know, and um, we will all see how um, that plays together. Yeah, what uh, the public side, government side, municipality side, and the private side can jointly contribute uh, for the benefit um, for the for the long time uh, benefit of uh, of buildings uh, 
and architecture. I mean, architecture is the first thing that people see when they come in our cities. And, uh, but then they, they are, will be curious to learn more uh, why, why we are uh, such uh, things or however we want to describe it if, in case we should um, finally succeed, yeah. But um, that will be an um, important point also for all, all members of the group uh, to develop a joint message for the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like we did today, you know, what, 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 is, what do we tell our audiences in their respective countries about um, all the aspects that, um, that we represent jointly, differently in each place, but also a hospital that joined the, what really binds us together as a world heritage. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mengele. And now Paul Simons was, I think, the next one, and then Mario. Paul, uh, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Professor Haspel. Um, I'd just like to make a comment about the, uh, your point about protection, preserving uh, the heritage, particularly the UNESCO criteria, and the other great uh, UNESCO and ICOMOS initiative, which is in recent years has been called Historic Urban Landscapes. And I think this is our challenge as we go forward, because spa towns uh, as, as heritage are also dynamic living places with economic activity, social issues. And we do not intend to put our spa towns in aspic, freeze them. We, they have to live. They, and as, as such, they have to develop. If I may just take two minutes to tell you the story of Bath. Because um, we use this argument when we had an, uh, uh, an urban competition in the year 2000 to celebrate the millennium to rebuild our thermal baths and our heritage agencies in the, in, in, nationally said we do not want a pastiche piece of Georgian architecture in the middle of your world heritage site, we want a modern contemporary building of the highest quality and we looked at our history and in five times uh, from the Roman times then in the medieval times when the monastic church took over the hot springs. Then in Elizabethan times when Henry VIII threw out the church and they became the owner of the city. Uh, uh, burghers, the merchants became the owners of the spa. Then in the 18th century when uh, three people destroyed the whole medieval town and built a Georgian utopian paradise. And now in the 21st century. And each time when the wealth and economic prosperity of Bath has been rejuvenated, the first project in each time that that has happened has been the reconstruction of the thermal baths. The spa, the main spa piece of architecture in the city centre has been the flagship, has been the landmark project for not only uh, preserving the, the raison d'etre of this very settlement, but also pointing to the future of that settlement. And when Georgian Bath was built, um, and that is the World Heritage Site, as you rightly point out, is listed now, the Georgians were not looking to the past. They destroyed a medieval city. They were looking to the future. Georgian architecture was the brave new world in 1720, and that's what they went for. And I hope very much that in our nomination, we've expressed that sentiment uh, and that underpinning theory as how our Spa towns had, had a future, have a future today, and certainly have a very important future to play uh, in the future as we evolve. At the same time, respecting that thermal heritage at every point, it's quite a challenge. Uh, you're, you're muted, George. Thank you very much for this uh, look back to the history of uh, Bath. Uh, and, and we, we know that in the Georgian time, when it has been redeveloped and reshaped, it was not yet World Heritage Site. So maybe it was easier to say goodbye to the past and to the Middle Ages than it will become today. That is why we are discussing it. And you mentioned this term of um, ur historic urban landscape. And when you have the next meeting, as far as I understood, you will especially discuss the question of the urban dimension and of the landscape aspect in the whole development. And I think that's very important and uh, interesting. And maybe 
the next time in 2022, <laughs> if I may recommend the, the scientific council, you can discuss questions of restoration and conservation on a very, um, on, on the, um, on the level of single buildings and of decorations, because that is also very important and I, interesting and also teaching to people, to guests who, who come there. Now it's to Mario and I would like to close this round because we wanted to discuss the, 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 the contribution of thermal architecture and of thermal, thermal towns to the development and to the post pandemic uh, time after COVID-19 uh, in, the, in the last round. So Mario, now it's your uh, turn. Thank you, George. Uh, first point, uh, Professor Haspel make a very interesting question about managing the uses on the buildings. I think it's not a problem for thermal towns, it's a general question for the relation between heritage and tourism. It is also a connection between past and present and the decision about uses, what type of uses could be done in what type of building or places, I think is a, a very important question that uh, occupy not only thermal towns, in general, the relation between heritage and tourism. Other important point uh, she made is about thermal towns managing and maintaining that. I think that our mission is to achieve that the thermal towns of the 21th century maintain the origin of the thermal towns of the past, and especially now that we have to face the post-COVID towns, as Professor Haspel uh, uh, suggested them, uses, maintain the origin of our Thermal towns as managing thermal waters, I think there are the key points that are involved in that. As the Professor Haspel said, we are going to change the, 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 the questions. I want to congratulate all my colleagues, Paul, Andreas, Anke, Lucia, Lisa, Professor Mengele, and Baker. And all of you, I think, confirm my our expectations. Paul and I, I think you make a very good presentation. Only make a point that you comment on the beginning that uh, all of our towns has, unfortunately, a history of wars. But some concrete moment or years couldn't define a history of centuries. And then we are here for the question we share, water, tourists, and heritage. And this is the base of our route. This is the base of our network. And this is the base, I think, for the uh, great space of Europe candidature, the thing we share. And the uh, other question that is pointed uh, in, in some occasion is about the urban level. We couldn't understand thermal towns without, without this reflection on urban level on landscape. And this is why we are proposing that in 2021, an urban level discussion could be done on thermal towns. And if it be possible to do as we think and prepare in Saratoga Springs, could be great. I hope to see you, all of you there in this next meeting and in this next discussion about thermal heritage in Europe from the external perspective of Saratoga. And that's all, thank you. Thank you very much for the contribution and thank you very much for this uh, perspective for the next years. When, when we started the discussion uh, and when we had our preparatory meetings here for this discussion, we discussed also the challenge of COVID-19 and the question, is there a specific contribution of thermal towns for the future, for the post-COVID times. And I, I would like to, to ask, uh, is the, do uh, thermal towns, do you, they have specific problems today which are different from other towns or is it similar? But what is even more interesting for me, from my point of view is, is the model of thermal towns and of thermal or spa cities is it for the post-corona time maybe also a, a model or an example which could be discussed because we have to change our cities and our towns, mm -hmm. not only because of pandemic, but also because of traffic, because of climate change, because of, uh, of sustainable development and so on. And so my, ask, I would like to ask all the speakers, do you think that um, spa towns can contribute to solve problems of the future on a more general uh, level. Maybe we can start with Anna Baker. Yep. <laughs> yes. 
Hi. Um, yeah, I definitely think there's opportunity there to learn because spa towns are so different from the major cities, you know, elsewhere, certainly in the UK, where people, you know, life is much more spread out. Uh, it's much more focused on natural connection. I think people benefit from that space and then maybe a slightly slower pace of life where it's less commercial in a traditional sense, you know, less office worker type mentality and the kind of busy, busy, busy nature. Um, and people, I think, are drawn more to spa towns because they already have an appreciation of, of those elements of life and a slow pace of life and a, a you know, green um, sense of living and more people will be drawn to that in the future, I think, for sure. Okay, thank you very much. And may I ask uh, the other World Heritage Site Managers who are designated site managers, do you share this uh, position of Anna Baker and uh, the experience of Bath? Ms. Pöschke? Yes. <clears throat> Yes, yeah, sure, sure. I, I would support um, Anna's um, um, impression. And I think we, we can see it nowadays as well. Um, many people coming from, uh, coming from, coming nationwide to Baden-Baden, not in the moment, not as international as us usually, but uh, nationwide. And people being here, coming here uh, to Baden-Baden, um, they, they find a city which is very green, which is very connected to the to the to the forestry on the, um, outside the, um, the the settlement, but it's part of the settlement. The many many green, many gardens and parks are there, and it's quiet, um, more quiet than in other cities. It's less traffic. We 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 are working to improve this uh, traffic situation. We are working on sustainable traffic systems. Um, but we offer a huge, um, um, a huge um, um, angebot, uh, offer of um, places to to stay and to relax and to recover from stressy cities, bigger cities, other cities. And I think we could be a good bl blueprint. And we have a lot of things to. To, to share um, best practice um, of living in a in a high quality city with a high um, uh, life quality, yes. And thank you very much. I, I saw that uh, Anke Matis and Lucy Zohorkova that you nod your head, so you agree with this perspective of the others, and that may maybe give me the chance to switch over to the last point we should discuss because. This is a World Heritage nomination, which includes six or seven uh, state parties of the UNESCO Convention for World Heritage Sites, including uh, 11 uh, locations and destinations. And when we are looking at the operational guidelines for the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, there is one requiry, requirement is that you have to present and to prepare uh, um, uh, um, heritage, world heritage uh, management plan. And this is more than an addition of 11 world heritage management plan, but it should be an, a comprehensive and an integrated management plan. And my question is only, how do you organize this process of communication, of communication and of agreement, which is necessary to guarantee the world heritage quality for the future. How, how is the model, how are the instruments, how are the tools to organize this process in the future? Not in the nomination, you have the dossier. Every, each uh, mayor has signed the dossier, that's easy, but, but in the future. Sometimes it's much more interesting and uh, more challenge to uh, remain a world heritage site than to become the label and the, the, the certificate. So my question is, how can you organize this? And this is a question, especially to all the World Heritage Managers who are here um, in, in the room. Maybe we can start with uh, Anke Matis and Vichy. How, is, how do you organize it? How do you organize yourself? Well, we have a different, um, how do you say, strat <laughs> things. There's nothing, I mean, um, done, 
it's very artisanal, I, I, I would say, or pragmatic, maybe. Uh, it, it's better. On a technical point of view, uh, we have um, technical committee uh, between uh, our city departments, uh, the urban community on an institutional level. It's, uh, it's a public part is quite important, so you, you have to to talk to all these big institutions. But this is only one part, and then you have to involve uh, what I say um, the private uh, part. And this private part is very wise. You have inhabitants. You have. Uh, uh, economic parts, uh, business people, so it's, you have so many categories and it's not so easy to put all these people in one uh, room and, and to deliver one speech and everybody. Each category of people has different kind of problematics. Inhabitants have problematics. People who manage hotels or restaurants in a town have specific problematics. Um, people who, who rent, who manage, um, I say, uh, immobilier, ah, uh, this, well, who, who rent uh, things, uh, houses, apartments, they have specific uh, issues. So I think you, you have to meet all these people uh, on a I don't know. Um, each year, you have to to define uh, um, uh, the, the good tempo uh, to take your time to listen to questions, the problematics, and, and, and to big answers. So I don't think that uh, we need, of course, this big uh, conference uh, annually. What we're going to do, so with public meetings, or so we're in Vichy, we we try to keep a good six months or one year we are with the COVID situation it's a bit different but yeah we, we try to keep this big moment one time in a year but besides this we are working in small groups with each category of inhabitants to talk about specific issues well it's just yeah what i am okay uh, and thank you very much uh, Anke Matis and uh, the same question to Carlo Vivari which is not only or you are not only representing Carlo Vivari, but also the, the Bohemian Triangle of, of spas. And so you are already uh, have experience in cooperating and in, in communicating, and maybe this could give a good example. And what is the role of the European Historic Thermal Town Association in this process? Is this a basis? Is this a, a fundament for the whole issue? Or is it something which is uh, accompanying only the process. Uh, so, uh, there are also the different levels. Uh, as you said, uh, we are the many, many uh, towns in the, this triangle, and that's the cooperation uh, between the state site managers and between the mayors. And then uh, the, each city has the local steering group, which, is, uh, which consists from the different stakeholders. And very important is, for example, the National Heritage Institute or the research institutions or organizations which care about the forests or the parks. So the communication with them and with the aims of uh, the management plan is important. And uh, the next point is uh, what is important to give an information to the local inhabitants. So we make uh, also together as these three cities from this triangle are making the presentation uh, for for the local inhabitants about this nomination. Thank you very much. I didn't get uh, the rest or the last sentence, but uh, I realized uh, how, how do you uh, work and how are your um, your uh, aims to, to do this. Uh, if you compare it, uh, Mrs. Pöschke, with the situation in Germany, we have three contributions from the Czech Republic, which are in this, uh, uh, in this triangle. How is the cooperation, for example, among the German uh, participants of the whole nomination dossier? Is there a cooperation? Unmute. Speaker on, please. Okay, now? 
Okay, uh, sure, yes, there is a um, national cooperation of our three um, state parties, Baden-Württemberg, um, Rheinland-Pfalz and um, Bavaria, and we are working together for uh, several years um, because uh, we have learned um, working on the World Heritage nomination that all our, uh, that we do not only have different legal systems in the different seven states, but we also have some, somehow, also uh, different um, different legal systems on national or regional base. So it was necessary to work together to find out what, what are our common aims and uh, also to organize um, the different um, um, the, the different regional um, Voraussetzung, um, um, preconditions preconditions uh, for our, no our nomination dossier. But that helped us also to, to organize and coordinate uh, special uh, ways of working together, of uh, working on special themes, um, uh, heritage protection, also sharing best practice or so. So that's not only a, um, a functional um, um, cooperation, but also um, 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 a, a cooperation which, um, which helps us to to solve problems in our cities. Yes, we have them. Thank you very much. And um, Anna Baker, uh, maybe you will close this round uh, okay. about the cooperation because you and Bath, you are in a very specific position. You, Bath is already inscribed as World Heritage Sites and now it will become double binded as a World Heritage Site because it is part of the serial nomination. How do you, do you deal with this? Are the responsibilities, are these the same people? Are these the same experts? Or is it differently organized uh, in, in the town? I think I might need to defer to Paul Simons on that detail. He's okay. much closer than I am. <laughs> Thank you, if I, if I may, because I've also had a, a role in coordinating the Great Spa's uh, management plan uh, that uh, the city of Bath has, has certainly learned over 32 years how to use the, uh, the management plan uh, according to uh, the requirements of UNESCO to enhance its abilities to manage the city uh, and to bring together what were previously seen as diverse aspects of those responsible for uh, the urban fabric uh, for managing it, uh, those involved in uh, the economic life of the city and those involved in particular in the tourism aspects of the city and bringing them together has been a really important learning curve that's taken a number of years. Uh, and one interesting fact is that as we are now heading for our fifth iteration of our management plan, that each time we do it, they get smaller, they get less complicated. Really? because you're, you're people, people are then knowing what you're talking about and they understand the issues. And therefore it's had a longer term uh, effect of actually improving general knowledge as to the uh, aspirations and objectives of world heritage. If I could just say two other quick things. One is for the great spas, it's very clear that the overarching management plan has to bring added value to all 11 members whilst respecting that we're not all the same and we do have diversity. And the idea is not to squeeze out diversity, it's to uh, be able to complement it. Because our spa towns are not all the same, they each bring a substantial contribution to the concept, but they don't all bring 100% of that. So we have to allow diversity within management. And lastly, you mentioned what can etch to do in the future. I think the Great Spas has been a great privilege to develop it over the last 10 years because we've had substantial resources. Those resources have helped us to research and learn a great deal more. And that knowledge uh, and that uh, learning to work together very closely as we go forward on issues of conservation, protection, interpretation, uh, tourism and economic activity, um, have, give, uh, have given us a duty as well, and this has been emphasized by UNESCO personnel, to pass on that experience to all the many other spa towns in Europe that you've mentioned, those involved in the cultural route network and beyond that. And I think it's a duty on the 11 
to uh, uh, spread the benefit of what it has learned in the process to help other smaller and lesser well-known spa towns in their management as they go forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for this comment, which I can also use as a closing remark, uh, because it is emphasizing the question of diversity to enforce and to support diverse, diversity, even if there are similar levels and criteria, and also to share the knowledge and the experience and the good examples or a good practice with other cities and with other locations, because World Heritage uh, status is not for the World Heritage sites only, it is also for the benefit of the others. And I think this is a very uh, great, uh, not only challenge, but also responsibility to think about how can we make them learn and how can we ch share this experience, not only among the privileged and exclusive circle of World Heritage Sites, but with others. And so I would like to close here. I would like to thank all the speakers uh, in advance um, and hope you will have an, a nice uh, digital walking tour through Baden-Baden, guided by Ms. Pritschke and Smil Hanti. And we'll give back now to our chief moderator, Simone. <laughs> thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, Professor Haspel and all participants of the round table. Um, I think this has been a really great exchange and um, it has shown that there is so much still uh, to talk about. And um, if I understand well, I think we have a whole lineup now for future meetings and exchanges. So um, it has um, showed that this has only been a start. Um, but I think uh, wrapping up, um, we can uh, do that later at the very end of our uh, European Thermal Heritage Day. So as Mr. Uh, Professor Haspel just announced, um, our hosts, Lisa, Smitty, and of course, uh, the city of Baden-Baden all together, um, you would like and you will take us on a digital walking tour because regrettably we cannot walk behind you right now. Um, so um, please, if everybody um, can um, just stay, it is about, let's say, 22 minutes, I think. We have a, a walking tour, so we will be in our time and schedule, and it's going to be really interesting. And um, after that, we all meet here in our virtual room again. And please then turn on all your cameras, because I really hope for a nice closing part with you, all of you together. And um, now I just leave the floor in a digital way uh, to the presentation of the walking tour. The spa town of Baden-Baden is located on the northwestern edge of the Black Forest in the state of Baden-Württemberg. Baden-Baden is part of the transnational serial nomination of the great spas of Europe. Our city is unrivaled example of a German gambling spa town and was one of Europe's fa most fashionable spa towns in the 19th century. They called it summer capital of Europe. All development phases have been preserved in the city's physical structure, but the 19th century is predominant. My name is Lisa Pötschke. I'm head of the Department of World Heritage Nomination and Urban Design. My name is Smriti Pant. I am a research associate in Lisa's department. And today we will take you on a journey through thermal architecture in Baden-Baden. We are standing here on the terrace of the new palace. As you can see, the town is situated below craggy and wooden, wooded mountains lying in the valley of the River Oz. In fact, with 7,400 hectares of woodland, the town of Baden-Baden is the largest German forest owner. The old town lies on the slopes of the Florentine Hill on the right bank of the Oz River. On the other hand, the new spa quarter is clearly segregated as a spa ensemble which dates to the 19th century and lies on the opposite side of the river.
We are currently at the market square in Baden-Baden. On top of the hill stands the new palace, the former resident of the Margraves of Baden. And it is from the slopes of this hill that the 12 thermal water springs originate. The use of thermal water in Baden-Baden dates, dates back to Roman times. In the 2nd century, Roman garnisons came to Baden-Baden and founded a settlement, um, which was named Aque. This name can be translated to Bath, which gives a hint on the special hot springs. There are remains of the Roman bathing facilities here under this marketplace. Remains of the soldiers' baths with sophisticated heating and water technology are still located below the Friedrichsbad. The ruins were rediscovered in 1847. Today the site is a museum. In the Middle Ages the qualities of the thermal springs of Baden-Baden were rediscovered. The very first German language non-medical spa guide published in 1480 by Hans Volz mentioned the baths of Baden-Baden, Bad Ems, Baden by Wien, Carlo Vivari and many others. Medieval bathing took place in a modest way, especially in the bathing houses. Around 1600 in the spa, our spa prospered with about 10 bathing houses, huts, over 300 bathing cabins and 3,000 baths a year. Depending on the physician and the progress of the research, the medicinal sources were used for many diseases, for example, rheumatic complaints or childless of women, childlessness of women. On the contrary, in the 17th century, Margrave Ferdinand Maximilian created the richly stuccoed Prunkbad on the ground floor of the new palace on the Florentine Hill. During the war of the Palatinate succession between France and the Holy Roman Empire, Baden-Baden was burned to the ground in 1689. Due to the Palatinate War, the town lost its status as the capital of the Margraves of Baden that it had held since the 12th century. Almost no medieval buildings survived the fire, but the urban structure still gives testimony. After the destruction, the city was partly rebuilt, but the bathing system almost came to a standstill in the 18th century. We've left the old spa town now and enter <coughs> the new spa quarter on the west side of the River Oz. The construction of the promenade house in 1766 and the creation of the chestnut alley um, was the starting point for the shift of the social life towards the open landscape and in the same time to Baden-Baden's transformation into a sophisticated spa town. Promenade house at the end of the chestnut alley was later integrated into the new cure house. In 1775, at the initiative of Margrave Karl Friedrich, a bath commission was set up to increase the attractiveness of the spa town. This commission created a plan for development and use of the surrounding areas of Baden-Baden for spa and recreational purposes. Based on this plan, the first walking paths and viewpoints were laid out in the immediate vicinity of the Kurgarten as well as benches for resting. In the 1810s and 1820s, the Grand Duchy's director of building, Friedrich Weinbrenner, was commissioned to expand and renew the spa district. From the dawn of the 19th century, the town was systematically transformed into a modern spa quarter. The old city gates and old city walls were demolished and the town spread farther into the Oz Valley and the surrounding landscape. 
The Conversation House or Cure House was built in 1821 to 1824, also by Friedrich Weinbrenner, in the then popular neoclassical style, incorporating the Promenade House from the 18th century. This followed the increasing requirements of creating a high standards pattern. Originally, the Cure House incorporated and housed gambling rooms, a library, a ballroom, a restaurant and a theatre. It was here in the Cure House and Casino that Baden Baden acquired a worldwide reputation as the supreme example of the gaming spa. The gaming casino, which was in operation from the 1820s to around 1870, provided a major attraction for international guests and became a model for the casino in Monte Carlo. In the northern wing, the Weinbrenner Design Theatre was re replaced in 1853 to 1855 by four state rooms, so-called Prunksäle. They were designed by the French theatre architect Charles Polycarp Séchant for the casino leaseholder and French businessman Edouard Benazé. They are decorated in various versions of French Baroque, from Louis XIII to Louis XVI, very much in the taste of the Second French Empire. The Florentine Room, also called House of the Thousand Candles, is in the style of Louis XIII. All the original Cichon paintings are in the style of the Florentine Renaissance. The Red Hall is based on a hall in Versailles in the style of Louis XIV, showing the taste of the French Baroque. The Winter Garden owns style elements from the period of Louis XVI, showing 16 Chinese vases and two fountains. The boutiques lining the Chestnut Alley were designed from 1866 to 1867 after Parisian models by German architect Karl Danfeld. They replaced the earlier wooden boutiques by British Weinbanner. Attached to the building's western end is the concert muscle, a band shell which was added under German architect August Stutzernacker. In 1839 to 1842, the axisymmetrical pump room was built by the German architect Heinrich Hübsch, a student of Friedrich Weinbrenner. The Trinkhalle was supplied with thermal water from Florentine Hill, you see it over there, and uh, from the opposite side of the river Oos. Thermal spring waters were piped from their sources in Florentine Hill. Uh, under the, their own head of pressure through a pipeline to the pump room. It was a combination of a pump room and a colonnaded walkway. The axis symmetrical structure consisting of a sandstone building with a square pump room and secondary rooms as well as a rectangular brick built colonnaded walkway adjoining it to the east. No less than 16 Corinthians and columns support the 90 meter long open hall. Three flights of stairs access the structure from the center front and the sides. Internally it is decorated with 14 frescoes that depict black forest legends by German mural painter Jacob Götzenberger. The imposing structure reflects the growing significance of the drinking cure at the beginning of the 19th century. It was also Edouard Benazé who financed in 1860 a new theatre designed by the Parisian architects Charles Dachy and Charles Couteau. It provided an appropriate setting for outstanding musical events, plays and dance productions of international renowned artists who also used the music pavilion and the premises of the Cure House. It is a two-story structure in French neo-baroque style on a rectangular ground plan 
without an elevated stage house. The facades are fashioned in light colored sandstone. The central axis of the main front is emphasized by a balcony surmounted by a pediment. The interior is laid out as a gallery theater with proscenium boxes in the late 18th century French tradition. The magnificent Louis XV tile decor has been preserved, including the ceiling by the French theatre painters Charles Antoine Cambon in, and Alexis Joseph Mazerol. The Staatliche Kunsthalle in Baden-Baden is a state-owned art museum. It was built by the Karlsruhe architect Hermann Billing on the initiative of painter, painter Robert Engelhorn from 1906 to 1909. The entrance stairs are flanked by personifications of painting and sculpture by Hermann Binz. The pre prestigious museum Frieda Burda is a private museum. It was built in 2004 by the world-famous New York star architect Richard Meyer. The museum is connected to the state Staatliche Kunsthalle by a glass walkway and it is considered as a high quality development of the cultural tradition of a spa town and the inherent part of the Lichtenthaler Alley. In course of the Enlightenment in the late 18th century, a new understanding of nature occurred along with a changed leisure behavior. Together with thermal water, drinking, inhalation and bathing treatments, physical activity in nature was inherent part of the 19th century cure. This development is mirrored in the design and organization of the Kurpark and the Lichtenthaler Allee. Johann Michael Zeyer transformed the Lichtenthaler Allee south of the Spa district into a spacious landscape garden from, 19, from 1839 onwards. The avenue extends along the Oos for 2.5 kilometers from Goetheplatz to the convent of Lichtenthal, offering a delightful park landscape with more than 20 iron bridges crossing the stream and numerous imposing trees. In the sense of the Enlightenment, the parks and gardens acted as meeting points between social classes. The fact that Baden-Baden gained international popularity as its spa from the, 19, uh, from the 1830s onwards is evident from the emergence of hotels with foreign names. Among the earliest large hotels lining the bank of the Oze were the Hotel Stéphanie Les Bains, the Hotel d'Angleterre, the Hotel de l'Europe and the Hotel de Russie. More hotels were situated in the old centre among them the prestigious Hotel de, Le Ho de Hollande and the Hotel Victoria, named after its most illustrious patron, Queen Victoria. The, hotel, the architecture of the hotels were oriented on the sophisticated hotels of the big European cities. One of them was the Hotel Stéphanie Le Bon, built in 1834. As early as 1872, the Brenner family of hoteliers acquired the hotel. At the beginning of the 20th century, after numerous enlargements, the building ensemble overlooking the Oos was more than 300 meter long in length and provided its international patrons with every conceivable luxury. Today, it is known as Brenner's Park Hotel and Spa.
The Hotel Badischer Hof was originally built in the 17th century as a Capuchin monastery. In 1807, German architect and city planner Friedrich Weinbrenner, known for his master, mastery of classical style, converted the secularized monastery into a spa hotel for the German publisher, industrial pioneer and politician Friedrich Kotter. Part of the neoclassical facade is still visible on Lange Straße. The building's central feature was a dining hall three stories in height, surrounded by colossal columns. We are now entering again the old spa district of Baden-Baden, close to Florentine Hill. Talking about the second big phase of the Baden-Baden spa history. As a result of the Franco-German War in 1870-71 and the prohibition of gaming in Baden-Baden, in Germany in 1872, um, the city had to reinvent itself. And Baden-Baden developed from, a, from an international fashion resort into a bath and spa and health resort. In the last third of the 19th century, modern bathing palaces were created near the thermal springs, replacing the old town quarter. By 1890, the realignment of the city led to the increase in spa guests to about 60,000. The reason was the Friedrichsbad the most modern bathing palace of its times, which offered extremely advanced therapeutic facilities. The monumental Neo-Renaissance building was constructed from 1869 to 1877 by architect Karl Danfeld as a spa and society bathhouse. It was constructed on the orders of Grand Duke Friedrich von Baden on the site of the old Roman baths. The Duke's architect, Karl Denfeld, started preparing for the planning process from 1868. He visited the most important spas and bathing facilities of Europe of the time. The entire complex, consisting of three blocks in a neo-Renaissance style, is set on terraces built into the slope of Florentinaberg. The building was constructed as a spa and society bathhouse of the highest standards, being cited as, as the, most, the world's most cutting-edge biological institution. Today, the Friedrichsbad is still in use and has been preserved to a very large extent, including the interior fitting. Today, Baden-Baden continues to attract an international public as a spa town. The 20th and 21st century brought various high-quality architectural additions and developments, adding to the character of Baden-Baden as a modern and vivid spa town, by preserving the rich heritage of a 19th century spa town. Baden-Baden still contains the characteristically different functional quarters, representing the particular type of settlement of a 19th century spa town in its entirety. These quarters include the old spa town, the new spa district, the parts of the planned urban expansions 
and the two main villa quarters to the west and the east of the old town. The Lichtenthaler Allee connects all these quarters with one another. We hope you have enjoyed our thermal architecture walk through Baden-Baden. And we look forward to welcoming you very soon in our town. Thank you very much. I hope Lisa and Smirti, you are now listening and you're coming back to the screen very quickly. Um, it, especially because the weather is like this today here, really. So it felt like really walking behind you. I can just share this with all of you. So you would have had the coats and it would have been pretty windy and a little bit rainy. So um, just for you to know, um, thank you very much for now showing us what we have talked about in those last uh, almost four hours. And um, I think you really brought it to quite a vivid um, experience. And um, so I'm just looking if our president is still with us because we plan to say goodbye to you together. Um, Elsie, before we are summarizing and closing up, um, I really would like to encourage all of you Turn on your cameras and if you have questions still to drop in general, if you have any comments, what you have just now seen, if you have questions to Lisa um, and to Smriti, um, please drop it now. I'm trying to follow the chat as well. I have almost everybody on the screen. Um, you're very welcome now to share with all of us your opinions and your questions. <laughs> Come on, at least give some, um, Lisa, maybe a little bit feedback. <laughs> and yes, you can all turn on your uh, microphones before. Thank you, Andreas. Okay, one thumb up. Okay, this is nice. <laughs> Andreas, would you say anything, or? No, he was just congratulating, I think. All right. Um, if there's nothing, Catherine, I just also look at you. Do we have anything on social media in between? Because um, we were following this as well. Um, if there was, um, if we had some feedbacks there. Uh, no, just uh, just some likes and things. No questions though, unfortunately. Okay. Lisa and Smriti, I thought you were fantastic. Thank you for taking us around Baden Baden. It was, I was so disappointed not to be there today because it's my favorite place. So, uh, yeah, well done, you guys. Brilliant. Okay. Yes, at least both of you are now in the picture. Um, so, okay, if there are no more questions and uh, feedbacks, um, I think what uh, we really, what we can all together summarize, um, and this is, has lined up throughout um, all the um, um, people and uh, all of you that we have heard and shared, um, I think thermal architecture is only one piece and one part of this entire thermal heritage we all are representing. And um, I referred to very much in the beginning um, when we heard from uh, Ms. Ringbeck that um, thermal towns are a shining example of shared heritage in Europe. And um, in this case, it is also a very good example of being a cultural route and um, sharing this cultural heritage of uh, historic thermal towns um, in, in, um, in Europe. And um, what has also been uh, all over your, um, uh, 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 yeah, um, all of your uh, information sharing with us was um, Spa towns, um, and I think Paul mentioned this uh, as the first one, and then it followed by the various uh, speakers. Um, they have always reinvented themselves over the centuries. And um, with all the exceptional values, this was also um, said, um, with all the authenticity, um, spa towns and the thermal heritage especially um, represents, um, yes, spa towns have survived pandemics before. We have learned, we have listened to this um, 
very also in the, uh, different um, cases and um, these dynamic places of living I think it was when Mario mentioned this um, they really have the potential to um, take opportunities and now opportunity out of this current pandemic and um, I think I really can leave it up to um, this one sentence that was really mentioned in the beginning um, when we say we take opportunities um, for the spa towns representing thermal heritage all over Europe and there is so much more to tell there is no so much more to exchange and learn about and um, really pay attention to how to preserve and how to protect this outstanding um, cultural heritage and thermal heritage and it only works all together, it only works in networks, in, it also works only in cooperations and really sharing this knowledge and sharing the experiences. And this is why I'm closing really happily with this one sentence from our president, together we are stronger. And I really thank you for participating today in the European Thermal Heritage Day 2020. And let's be strong together. Let's look forward to next year when we are focusing on another topic. And I thank you for being there today with all of us. Thank you. Thank you. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. And um, when we now we are officially closing this official part, you're very welcome also to stay online. Just for the Echta family, if you want. <laughs> Lisa.